the most important thing, the family photo has been, is, is done, so we can start now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, uh, let me open this event on gender equality, Presidency Conference on Gender Equality, organized by the head of uh, the office of the Czech government. My name is Linda Bartoshova, and I will be your moderator today. I'm very glad that so many of you uh, gathered here in Prague personally or online because the whole conference is streamed online as well. We all probably agree that Europe is at a turning point. The pandemic, Russian invasion of Ukraine, energy poverty, refugee crisis, climate change. Altogether, that is a mix of challenges that Union has never probably faced before. The way we face and treat those challenges now will probably form the future of the young generation and the surrounding that the generation will live in. Dialogue and discussion is the key starting point to change, so I'm glad that uh, we gathered here today to, de to debate the impacts of current socio-economic challenges from gender equality perspective as well as from the young generation perspective. The fact is that the Czech Republic doesn't really belong uh, among champions in gender equality, so I'm happy that we are having the best gender experts from uh, Europe uh, today here in Prague, and that it's possible to offer some keynote speeches and discussions uh, from gender equality experts all around Europe here. It is my honor now to welcome here our honorable guests for the opening speeches. Let me now introduce Ms. Jana Kotalikova, the head of the office of the Czech government who is hosting today's conference. Friends. Welcome. Let me also welcome Mr. Ivan Bartosz, the Deputy Prime Minister for Digitization and Minister for Regional Development. Welcome. I'm also glad that Ms. Viera Jourova, the Vice President of the European Commission for Values and Transparency, accepted the invitation. And then we have two very honorable guests representing France and Sweden, two countries sharing the presidency trio with the Czech Republic. We have here Ms. Isabel Lombichon, French Minister for Gender Equality, Diversity and Equal Opportunities. Welcome. And last but not least, we are joined by Mr. Fredrik Jorgensen, the Swedish ambassador in Prague. Now the open opening speech will be held by Ms. Jana Kotalikova. Dear Vice President uh, Jourova, dear Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Prime Minister Peter Fiala, I would like to welcome you to our Presidency Conference on Gender Equality. I would like to thank Vice President uh, Viera Jourova, Minister Isabel Onvisrom, and Ambassador Frederik Jergensen for joining us today. I also want to use this opportunity to thank my French and Swedish counterparts for a very friendly and productive cooperation on promotion of gender equality during our trio presidency. Europe is facing unprecedented challenges. The COVID pandemic has changed our lives and caused significant economic hardships. Right after the most severe waves of pandemic passed, another blow to our lives has come. Of course, I am speaking about the Russian invasion to Ukraine. The Russian aggression has shattered peace in Europe and violated humanitarian principles and human rights. At the same time, though, the invasion proved that we Europeans are able to stand united to act quickly and effectively. I am proud we managed to provide immediate assistance to Ukraine and people affected by the war. I am proud that streets of Prague, just like many other European cities, cities are filled with Ukrainian flags in the spirit of solidarity and support. And I am proud that European countries, including the Czech Republic, provide protection and considerable support to over 5 million people, mainly women and their children, fleeing from the war. The unfortunate combination of the pandemic, the Russian aggression against Ukraine, and rising prices of energy triggered fundamental economic and social challenges four years ahead. And the Czech presidency has already started to facilitate a search for common solutions. We built upon the legacy of Václav Havel, the first president of the Czech Republic, who conceived the phrase Europe as a task, 
Although Havel's memorable view of Europe originated in a different time and, uh, of course, in a different kind of Europe, its basic message is still strong as today. The Czech Republic is following the message during our presidency. We reflect this in our slogan, Rethink, Rebuild, Repower, which refers to the challenges and problems of today's Europe. The task of our presidency is to contribute to the maximum extent possible to creating the conditions for a safe and prosperous European Union based on the European values of freedom and democracy, free market, social justice, rule of law and environmental responsibility. I would like to stress that most of our political priorities have a strong social dimension and are related to human rights and gender equality. The first priority managing the refugee crisis is closely related to the ability to help people fleeing Ukraine, mostly women and children, taking into account their specific needs. Member states must ensure that the refugees have access to basic services. They need to integrate them properly into the labor market and society in general. Ensuring energy security, the second priority of the Czech presidency, is cl crucial for preventing energy poverty, which is more often troubling single women, older people and other groups. The Russian aggression is directly connected to problems of rising energy and food prices. We want to focus on implementing an appropriate combination of tools such as effective social measures and the support for household energy savings, which will reduce the negative social and economic aspect, impact. Another priority of our presidency program, ensuring the strategic resilience of the European economy, is closely related to the agenda of social policy and gender equality. Economic instability hits the most vulnerable people the hardest, threatening social cohesion and exacerbating social inequalities. The last priority, the resilience of democratic institutions, is closely linked to the protection of human rights, the promotion of dialogue with the civil sector and the promotion of European values, including gender equality. In other words, the social dimension is an integral and cross-cutting part of our presidency. We see two overarching themes in the area of gender equality, strengthening of the economic position of women and prevention and elimination of gender-based violence. These priorities are also expressed in the TRIO Declaration on Gender Equality adopted by the Czech Republic in January 2022 together with France and Sweden. Ladies and gentlemen, the promotion of equality between gender remains in a, an important task. I am glad that I can open today's conversation with you, the representatives of the Commission, European Parliament, Member States, social partners, civil sector and youth organization about the future of gender equality in the Union. At this presidency conference, we need to focus on the impact of the current social and economic challenges on women and men. Taking into account the European Year of Youth 2022, the conference should also facilitate a dialogue with the young generation addressing specific challenges faced by young people in the European Union. These are significant and extremely complicated tasks today, which are nevertheless crucial to achieving the union of equality tomorrow. Thank you again for meeting us here in Prague and joining us also online. I wish you a fruitful conversation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Kotalikova. Now let me pass the floor to Mr. Ivan Bartosz. He's in a hurry. <laughs> As you, may, as you probably see, I lost my notes, but I will talk somehow uh, the most important thing. So, dear Vice President, uh, Vice uh, President Jourova, dear ministers, dear excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you here in Prague at the Presidency Conference on Gender Equality and address you from my position of Deputy Prime Minister for Digitalization and Minister of Regional Development. I am glad that the 
to join you today and discuss the challenge we are, challenges we are facing. Uh, taking into account, and it was already mentioned here, that this year has been also dedicated the European Year of Youth. And I'm particularly happy that this conference is addressing the topic from the perspective of young generation as well. And when I'll get to that later on, uh, the gender equality and the options and the challenges are also very driven by the age of a, of a people who are entering the life. Europe indeed is facing turbulent times. It is on one hand the in, incomplete recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, but it's also rising living and housing costs, energy poverty, the green and digital transition and the war in Ukraine all of them have direct impact to life of European citizens. And those challenges, indeed, do have strong gender dimension. In my speech, I will address mainly gender equality and digital and green transition because those are the things I'm responsible for, especially to the ICT and digitalization area. It has been almost three years now since a pandemic outbreak and it affected every aspect of our lives, including the way we work. Uh, while the economy recovery from pandemic has begun, it remains, it remains incomplete. Uh, the pandemic has also accelerated the digital transformation and it represents both the opportunity and also the challenges for gender equality. The future of work will mean an increase in the demand for technology professionals, such as computer engineers, ICT specialists, etc. Clear gender segregation in education and labor markets continue to be seen in ICT education and uh, also in ICT occupation. Regrettably, if we take a look to the DESI index, the share of women among ICT professionals in Czechia is still the lowest in EU, but uh, don't be mistaken, it's also very low uh, all over the Europe. It's about uh, less than 20%, 19 something, five, I believe. Uh, the gender gap in technology remains one of the main barrier uh, for digitalization, I believe in Czechia, but also in uh, other countries. There is a great potential in changing the course of the trend and empowering women uh, to become ICT professionals that would also uh, contribute to achieving the goals of the European Digital Decade 2030 by increasing the number of digitally skilled citizens and highly skilled digital professionals with a focus on achieving the gender balance while promoting women's access in the field. Uh, you know the STA, STEM, uh, competencies are set to play an even more essential role. We should encourage girls, and I'm saying girls because, as I said, it's a question of the education, uh, also from the, from the childhood, from the first primary school and the high school. So we should break up those, uh, those stereotypes and the glass ceiling uh, because it's crucial uh, to have an equal education in all areas and especially those one that are relevant to 21st century and it will affect directly our labor market in labor market in future uh, moreover targeted measures development programs and career guidance free of gender stereotypes are needed to help to attract and retain uh, women and girls and young women in stem related careers uh, in the light of escalating impacts of climate change and Russia's aggression against Ukraine, uh, the task of bringing about the green transition has also become more urgent, urgent than ever before. However, those are not only the, uh, the policies we are trying to push through, but we also have to think of the direct impact of these policies to certain groups. It's not just a legal framework for the green and digital translation, but it has to be, and it has to be generation and uh, gender sensitive as well. And I'm happy we've got this conference and it's a topic we are discussing on that level. 
uh, young voices, including those from the EU candidate countries, should also be included in the policies making process with the Union, especially because of the climate change and increasing energy costs are global issue and have particular negative impacts on young and future generations. That's what this means. We are doing policies and we do politics in order to uh, somehow secure the future of the generations that are coming after us. So I hope we, we will be successful. All of them investments that are going to green and digital economy, economies had, of course, a big potential for jobs for youth. However, we do face pre-existing gender inequalities um, and uh, it's not just that natural. So get, let's take that as an option and once we invest in the transition, also make it attractive and equally accessible to all of the, all of the ages and also to both genders. And uh, I would uh, mention three main ideas I believe even today's conference will be, will be about. First, we really need to reflect the digitalization of work on women. Uh, that remote working that we experienced through the COVID has a great potential uh, to foster work-life balance, yet the pandemic showed us it also has its weaknesses on one side, uh, because uh, a lot of women were under double burden. They carry out their daily jobs, working remotely from home, and at the same time they were expected to provide education and care for the children. This led to poor work-life balance, and maybe a lot of us can agree with that because you experience it, you experience it by yourself. And also it went to, let's say, burn burnout, and we can see the figures from the psychiatrist branch of the idea so also it causes the health and mental issues as well because it was a very hard time to manage family and the jobs on one side so that well-being and it's not a swear word in many countries somehow felt like what the hell is well-being it's one of the important aspects that we have to uh, take care of when we when we affect the market and uh, also, it influenced the way of being, and it's often invisible for a lot of women. Because once you're working from home, someone who you don't see on an everyday basis, how can this person be promoted in the future? Uh, therefore, uh, uh, we have to take them challenges I mentioned, but also prevent such situations that I mentioned before. We need to face those challenges in the labor market and adjust that. Uh, we found out a lot of new working models, uh, also the benefits of digital working at the same time, and we have to tackle those negative impacts I've just mentioned, which is, of course, the role within the family and the options that you can have from, the, uh, from uh, this hybrid kind of work, which I would prefer rather than complete home office, because uh, being present also bring you, bring you opportunities. Uh, second, we need to encourage the digital competencies of women in Czech Republic. Uh, the ICT skills of women are comparatively lower than those of men's. And uh, when we take a look on European figures, almost 90% of jobs require at least some digital skills currently. So we don't want anyone to be excluded from the market and we for sure with this 10% in Czech and 20 in Europe being women excluded from the 21st century market. And uh, that's why when we talk upskilling and cross-skilling and educating society, we have to also uh, take a look at it from a gender point of view. And a lot of them, a lot of them jobs that are required, and uh, I believe you are vogue enough, but uh, ICT, it's not about being a programmer in Java, right? It requires a lot of skills that are not at all man-driven from testing, logics, uh, business development, um, solution analytics. Uh, there are all plenty, and if you take entertainment and the digital entertainment, it's architects, scriptwriters, musicians. So this area of ICT offers a lot of jobs, and we should address that to be them equally accessible. Uh, I've got a lot of notes, so I'll jump just through. Uh, I'm very happy and uh, it's important thing and we carry that from the pandemic time that everything is about cooperation and the competence that we are usually 
used to it uh, doesn't bring always the best results. So cooperation between the politicians, public sector, NGOs, academics, and business is essential. And I'm very happy we are achieving that and getting NGOs in Czech Republic, for example, Chiquitas, and all of them that are targeting the education, especially for, for women that are on board and are participating in a lot of programs. And I appreciate all of them, programs such as Digital Education Action, Erasmus Plus program, and all the upskill things that they already do understand that we are talking to both men and women, but also to the boys and the girls. Maybe third area, and I would, uh, I would end up with that. Uh, it's a platform working. Right now, uh, about 60% of workforce owned platforms are covered by men. We are addressing the issue of platforms on the European level of its, let's say, uh, supervised abusive uh, matter of uh, work-life balance, of uh, labor rights. Uh, if we see uh, disparity or inequality on the market that's visible from us, we should also take a look uh, on, the, on the position uh, that are within the platforms because many things are managed by flat platforms from the delivery, you know, whatever services, each of things, and uh, it's somehow hidden, something that is not visible from the very first moment. Uh, there are a lot of programs uh, uh, that are targeting the gender dimension in digitalization uh, in the crucial areas. Uh, therefore, I'm glad that the EU Gender Equality Strategy 2020-2025 promotes equality in digitalization as a priority, as well as our national gender equality strategy for 2021-2030. After all, the digitalization would be successful if we would do not let anyone behind. And it's, of course, uh, the question of a digital poverty. It's, of course, the question of the seniors who are not familiar with the technology, but also we would like to have equality and equity in participation of women within that transformation that's essential to our success. Uh, maybe those three areas I mentioned are the most important from my point of view. I wish you fruitful discussion today, opening important topics, but not only opening them, but finding uh, solutions to that that we can implement European-wide, but also on the national level. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Bartosz. And just for you to know, uh, Mr. Bartosz will have to leave, I guess, uh, soon, because he's opening another presidency conference. So just for you to know. Now I give the floor to the vice president of the commission, Ms. Vera Jourova. Dear Deputy uh, Prime Minister, dear Ministers, Excellencies, good morning. I am really happy to be here today with you uh, as always uh, when i appear in my city and uh, when i saw that the czech presidency decided to organize this conference i was extremely happy twice because this is my agenda already several years and uh, i want to tell the swedish colleagues that i will be equally eager to come to stockholm in case you organize similar events uh, in the next half of the year. It's a pity Mr. Deputy Prime Minister is leaving because I will quote some of his promises. <laughs> he will not be able to defend himself regarding the investments into kindergartens in Czechia. Have a good day. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I want to speak about serious, serious topics, so I should not make, uh, make jokes. Uh, I was in Ukraine last week, and when we were entering uh, the country, I saw so many strong women at the border. The men and women are fighting, including the women guarding the border. Then I saw very brave doctors, female doctors and female nurses. In the hospital in Lviv, which brought back to life 6,000 injured people, including children. And the name of the hospital is Unbreakable. Nezlomna in Ukrainian language. 
And I came back to European Union with a strong feeling that the nation is, Neslomni, is unbreakable. And I heard from so many people, including students at the Lviv University, that they are willing to bring highest sacrifices in order to join us, join the EU club of states, join the EU people. Uh, they want to live life uh, in the country which will also respect the highest possible values, including equality. So I was a bit sorry that I don't hear such strong voices in European Union member states so often. We got used to having all these values automatically, and I think that this is dangerous uh, to take the values for granted. And I don't only speak about equality and about, about uh, peace, but also democracy and rule of law. So, uh, sorry, I am still a little bit in thoughts in, in Lviv, uh, and I wanted to give you this message that uh, we have to continue our united support for the country and to stand ready against uh, the horrible aggression of Russia, which is weaponizing energy, weaponizing food, weaponizing lies. And so, uh, I am standing here in front of you, and my task is to speak about where we are with the gender equality in the EU. And I, I cannot help it, I had to start by describing my feelings after being in Ukraine. Where we are with gender equality in the EU. I am sure you don't want to hear analysis from me, you want to hear solutions, because I am already several years responsible for the agenda. So I will try to go through, uh, through the things uh, and plans and strategies and uh, regulations we, we are working on. The bitter truth is that all the negative trends we saw before COVID and before the war just exacerbated uh, over the pandemic and now, now during the war. The negative trend, uh, uh, factors like poverty, violence, uh, gender pay gap and low representation of women in decision-making positions and well-paid jobs as, as the Prime Minister, pri not Prime Minister, no, what is, who is it? Deputy Prime Minister spoke about. Uh, we saw alarming increase of domestic violence during COVID pandemic, including digital violence. That's why we, for the th first time, addressed this by regulation. After years of waiting for the Istanbul Convention to be ratified, we decided to bring into life the uh, violence, uh, the, the regulation against violence against women, which includes very important aspect of digital violence. For the first time, we go after that, because this is increasing incredibly. And as always, this directive uh, has relatively strong support in the European Parliament, which is the second co-legislator, with the Council, with the Member States. Well, we always hear the same thing. Yes, we are for gender equality, we will do everything. But then when we propose something concrete, we hear from several member states, at least half, yes, but what I hear, which is not sad, and which is sad, it's not easy to sell it at home. Because in several member states still, doing something for gender equality does not bring political medals and popularity with the voters. Always the same story. So, uh, this might be also the, the case of this uh, regulation against vi violence against women. <laughs> then economy and power, uh, poverty. Anytime I was proposing in the past uh, anything we did for gender equality, uh, when I used the arguments of fairness, it didn't fly so well everywhere. When I used the arguments of economy, when I had figures, much com more compelling moment. Because uh, what we see that to uh, not to do anything against uh, uh, pay gap and a low unemployment, low employment rate, uh, it is economically very short-sighted and uh, unwise. 
I have in, here in my paper the word stupid, which I didn't want to say, but you look friendly, so I dare to say that. Uh, we estimate that the economic loss due to the gender employment gap amounts to 320 billion euro per year. And we also estimated the loss uh, in case we do not invest into the facilities like in the gardens and creches. This is a, an incredibly big uh, market failure. We need public investments. And it's not public spending anymore. We changed our paradigm, let's say three years ago or four years ago, when we sent clear message to the member states. This is not spending, this is investment which comes very quickly back. So please invest also EU funding into these facilities. So we unleashed the potential of EU money and now all the member states can use European uh, ERDF, European Regional Development Fund, European Social Fund, uh, which could include also hard investments in some proportion plus uh, the uh, uh, recovery and resilience funding. And we expect the member states to use this opportunity and to enable the working parents to manage both the childcare at home and their jobs, which is especially important for women. Uh, speaking about unwise policy, and we see that 60% of those who finish the uh, um, university studies are women, and then the same ones disappear from the labor market. It's in Czechia, the figures are high, but I will not attack my country here in front of the uh, esteemed international forum. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's very alarming that we are not using the talents and the potential of women, especially educated women. <clears throat> Poverty. In 2020, uh, there were around 21% of men endangered by poverty and more than 23% of women. Between 2020 and 2022, we have incredible difference. We all know these figures are not getting better. On the contrary, the energy poverty will affect the women uh, probably more than the men. So that's why we reacted. Uh, we adopted the directive on adequate minimum wages and the recommendation on minimum income. No differentiation between men and women. Same benchmarks. We need to introduce equal conditions for, for both men and women. I am looking at Madame Bartoshova, whether I am not too long, am I? So I don't know if maybe we can prolong it a little bit. It's not really up to me. I, yeah, yeah, we can. I, okay. I need this encouragement. <laughs> I have something to say still. <laughs> no, I'll be, I'll be shorter. <clears throat> we introduced the work-life balance directives uh, several years ago. Again, uh, the negotiations went. Uh, more or less well. Now we expect the member states to implement the directive in full. The purpose of this directive was to enable uh, both men and women to combine their family uh, duties and, and work. Um, and uh, then the care strategy, it's connected with what I said about the childcare facilities. Uh, we increased the so-called Barcelona targets from 33 to 50 percent. So it's nice, no? So ambitious we are, 50 percent of the children uh, 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 under the age of three uh, to have a possibility. We are not forcing anyone to use the facilities, but to have the, choi the choice, the ac uh, accessible and affordable service and, and high quality uh, care for children, 50 percent. The bitter truth is that many member states still do not fulfill 33, which is the current or previous target. I will not name and shame, but the more you go to the east of Europe, the lower the number is. Something to uh, think about and to do something about it in, in the member states. Because if these member states uh, complain 
about the barriers for economic prosperity and complain about bad factors in the labor market, I would give them the advice, look into this, this issue, because you are not enabling the women to get back to work. And I want to be well understood. I was so happy to be a mother. I managed to have children before the revolution in 1989, <laughs> uh, at the age of 20. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that this is a, a, a fantastic role for, for women to be mothers. But it should not kill their chance to have a career and well-paid job. Because low-paid job or no job then is uh, getting the women into the vicious circle, uh, which also includes violence against women uh, in domestic conditions. Uh, we have very good ideas from many member states how to use the recovery funding. For instance, Cyprus, France, Italy, Portugal, Slovenia and Spain, including measures to improve access to finance for women ent entrepreneurs and support of startups. Measures supporting the digital transition with strong equality uh, parameter in it, Cyprus, Estonia, Finland, Latvia, Portugal, Spain, and Sweden, and several states also included specific actions on childcare in their national plans. And the case of Czechia is that they should increase the capacity of childcare facilities by 40% by 2025 by renovating or extending existing childcare facilities and constructing new nurseries for 800 86 million euro. This was the promise I wanted to confront Mr. Bartosz with. He escaped, but I'm sure he will go after that. His, his speech was very promising. Uh, so last but not least, I want to also repeat what already we heard that the year 2022 is the European Year of Youth. And I know that there are many representatives uh, of the next generation among the participants. So I want to wish you good luck. Uh, please correct everything bad which my generation spoiled. Uh, we have the latest Eurobarometer survey which says that for this generation, the most important three things are uh, environment, economic and social fairness, and equality. This is promising because I believe that if the young generation really feels need to do more on all political levels to achieve these three goals, we will be able to manage that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vice President. Also, Ms. Jana Gotalikova has to leave, so thank you very much for being here and for your speech. And now I give the floor to Isabelle Environ, the French Minister for Gender Equality. Madame la Vice-Présidente, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, Mesdames et Messieurs, n'oubliez jamais qu'il suffira d'une crise politique, économique ou religieuse pour que les droits des femmes soient remis en question. Ces droits ne sont jamais acquis. Ces mots, prononcés en 1949, par la philosophe féministe française Simone de Beauvoir, sont toujours aussi vrais en 2022. Il y a des batailles où l'urgence doit dicter notre engagement, où l'urgence doit commander tous nos actes, des batailles pour lesquelles nous ne pouvons plus attendre, des batailles que nous devons mener inlassablement car non, les choses ne changeront pas d'elles-mêmes. L'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes est de ces batailles. Car si en un siècle, nous avons réalisé davantage de progrès qu'en plusieurs millénaires, les inégalités n'ont pas disparu, les violences sexistes et sexuelles n'ont pas disparu et les discriminations n'ont pas été abolies. 
En d'autres termes, les progrès accomplis ne doivent pas nous éblouir. Et la fragilité persistante de la place des femmes dans nos sociétés doit nous alerter. Car l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes n'est pas encore terminée. L'actualité brûlante aux quatre coins de la planète nous le rappelle tous les jours. Les femmes ne se battent pas pour la moitié du ciel. Le combat pour l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes n'est pas un combat de quelques-unes contre quelques-uns. Car pour reprendre les mots du prix Nobel de la paix, Denis Mukwege, toute personne, avant d'appartenir à un sexe, appartient d'abord à l'humanité. Il s'agit donc d'un combat humaniste. Mesdames et messieurs, l'égalité est au cœur des valeurs européennes. Elle en est l'ADN et en a irrigué la construction. Si la lutte contre les violences faites aux femmes est la condition sine qua non pour parvenir à l'égalité réelle, l'autonomie économique des femmes en constitue un pilier essentiel. Car sans indépendance financière, nulle égalité, nulle liberté. L'autonomisation économique est la pierre angulaire de l'égalité des sexes. Elle permet en effet l'indépendance des femmes, leur contrôle sur leur propre temps, leurs propres ressources et par conséquent leur propre choix. Cet objectif a été au cœur de la présidence française du Conseil de l'Union européenne qui s'est achevée en juin dernier, ainsi que l'une des priorités du programme du trio de présidence. Le 31 janvier dernier, la France avait ainsi organisé une conférence ministérielle sur l'autonomisation économique des femmes. Une conférence durant laquelle le trio de présidence avait affirmé clairement que l'égalité économique et professionnelle est un enjeu de haute importance pour l'avenir de l'Europe. La France, la République tchèque et la Suède ont conçu le programme de leur présidence sur une certitude commune, la réalisation effective de l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes est une chance à saisir pour que l'Union européenne sorte de la crise plus forte et développe une économie résiliente, prospère et durable. Il s'agit pour nous d'une priorité absolue et je m'en réjouis. C'est un travail que nous menons de front en accord avec les priorités de la stratégie 2020-2025 de la Commission européenne pour l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes. Je salue à cette occasion l'action très volontariste en faveur de l'égalité menée par la vice-présidente de la Commission, Vera Jourova, et la commissaire Elena Dali. Je suis très heureuse d'être à vos côtés aujourd'hui. En France, l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes constitue la grande cause des quinquennats du président de la République. Si la lutte constitue le premier pilier, l'égalité économique et professionnelle est un axe majeur. Parce que l'Europe doit demeurer un espace de progrès social, c'est dans ce contexte qu'Emmanuel Macron en a fait une priorité de la présidence française du Conseil. Le 8 mars 2022 était ainsi placé par le chef de l'État sous le signe de l'économique au niveau européen. Après dix années de blocage, sous l'impulsion de la présidence française de l'Union européenne, je me réjouis que la directive Women on Boards ait enfin été adoptée. Il s'agit d'une avancée importante pour une meilleure représentation des femmes 
dans les hautes instances dirigeantes des entreprises. Une avancée qui permettra ainsi aux États membres de faire progresser leur législation nationale. Une avancée qui embarque aussi les entreprises, car, répétons-le, les pouvoirs publics ne peuvent pas tout. Nous avons absolument besoin du secteur privé pour parachever l'égalité en acte. À la fois miroir des inégalités, catalyseur des mutations de notre temps, les entreprises sont au cœur de cette transformation. Parce qu'elles ne sont pas imperméables aux inégalités, aux discriminations et aux violences, elles ne peuvent se désintéresser de la lutte pour l'égalité. Nombre d'entre elles ont déjà embrassé ce combat, mais elles doivent s'engager davantage. Cette conviction s'enracine dans une intuition forte. Les entreprises les plus citoyennes, celles qui érigent l'égalité en valeur cardinale de leur politique de ressources humaines, seront aussi demain les plus compétitives et les plus attractives. Je me réjouis de constater que de très grandes entreprises ont bien compris ce challenge. C'est pourquoi la présidence française de l'Union a vigoureusement soutenu le projet de directive de la Commission visant à renforcer l'application du principe de l'égalité des rémunérations entre hommes et femmes pour un même travail ou un travail de même valeur par la transparence des rémunérations et les mécanismes d'exécution. Il s'agit là aussi d'un enjeu essentiel. J'espère que nous pourrons continuer à avancer rapidement sur ce dossier. En 2018, la France a créé l'index de l'égalité professionnelle. C'est un outil de mesure et de transparence qui concerne toutes les entreprises de plus de 50 salariés et qui vise à résorber les inégalités salariales qui subsistent entre les femmes et les hommes. Des inégalités insupportables que nul ne peut comprendre. Et encore moins les jeunes générations impatientes que les inégalités se tarissent enfin. L'an dernier, nous avons également adopté une loi sur l'égalité économique et professionnelle qui instaure notamment des quotas de femmes dans les instances dirigeantes des entreprises. Par ailleurs, le congé paternité pour les pères a été étendu de 14 à 28 jours afin de favoriser une meilleure répartition des tâches entre hommes et femmes ainsi qu'un meilleur équilibre entre vie professionnelle et personnelle. Un enjeu majeur pour l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes. Mesdames et messieurs, en conclusion, permettez-moi de féliciter la présidence tchèque du Conseil de l'Union européenne d'avoir érigé en priorité de son agenda l'égalité entre les femmes et les hommes et d'avoir organisé la conférence d'aujourd'hui. Je sais que, comme moi, vous croyez en une, une Europe féministe. Une Europe à la pointe du combat contre toutes les formes d'inégalité, de violence et de discrimination. Alors qu'une vague de conservatisme déferle sur le monde, vague à laquelle l'Europe n'échappe pas, nous devons continuer à nous battre pour les droits des femmes. Des droits qui demeurent fragiles. Car s'attaquer aux droits des femmes, c'est s'attaquer à tous les droits humains. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, Madame Rom. Um, finally, the last speech will be held by Frederik Jergensen, the Swedish ambassador in Prague. Please.
Now, should I work with this? Uh, I think can you pick up You know how to do it? Well, I just bend down like this. We will see. Thank you so much. It's a great honor for me to, to be invited to, um, to this uh, conference with this vital theme, um, the Europe of tomorrow, gender equality and the economy. But as you know, Sweden recently held parliamentary elections and the process of forming a new government is still running. Uh, so our minister is staying at home in Stockholm. You have to uh, be satisfied with me. I hope that will be okay. Uh, but I will be outlining a few of our priorities as regards uh, gender equality and, and economy. Uh, and this is very much in the DNA of, of um, Swedish foreign policy, to, so to speak. So you will be uh, hearing uh, a few of the outlines, a few of the basic uh, priorities from, from our side. Uh, I would like to, to give part of the answers to the question, uh, what does it take to achieve a modern and prosperous welfare state which supports gender equal participation in the economy and in society at large? I will be getting you some of the experiences from Sweden, not saying by that that we have all the answers, but I will certainly try and, and give you a few of the Swedish answers. Uh, and going forward then will, is um, an exercise based on close cooperation, of course. To start with the global picture, uh, a recent UN Women report highlights that at the current rate of progress, it, make, it may take close to 300 years to achieve full gender equality. It's going a bit slow. I see you're nodding. The UN Women report also points out that globally, women lost an estimated 800 billion US dollars in income in 2020 as a consequence of the pandemic. An established viewpoint in Sweden is that gender equality is a key to make the economy prosper. This is at the essence of gender equality. It's good for all. It's good for the economy of the state as such. Uh, Women's participation in paid work increases GDP and reduces income inequality. Moreover, studies show uh, that gender equal societies tend actually to be happier, healthier and more trusting. There are so many values to be found in, in gender equality. The OECD estimates that an increase in female employment has accounted for 10 to 20 percent of the overall average annual growth rate in the Nordic countries over the past 50 years. The economic argument is strong. In societies where both women and men are economically and politically emancipated, research shows that there is more peace and less violence. And these are facts. So why should we keep half the workforce off the labor market? A recent study by the European Institute for Gender Equality showed that improving gender equality only within the EU would contribute to an increase in GDP of up to 10% in 2050. These are fantastic figures. The fact that Sweden often is put at the top of international rankings on gender equality is the result of long-term systematic reform work. We have been working with these issues for a very long time. The overall objective, objective guiding the Swedish gender equality policy uh, clarifies that women and men must have the same power to shape society and their own lives. This is the best, that's the basic foundation for all of this. Uh, with this as a starting point, Sweden has over the last years worked towards six sub-goals. I will venture into them very, very briefly. First, 
equal distribution of power and influence. Women and men must have the same rights and opportunities to be active citizens and to shape the conditions for decision-making in all sectors of society. Second, economic gender equality. Women and men must have the same opportunities and conditions for paid work that provide economic independence throughout life. Third, gender equality in education. Women and men, girls and boys, must have the same opportunities and conditions with regard to education, study options, and personal development. Fourth, and this you have touched upon already in, in the initial remarks here, uh, an equal distribution of unpaid housework and provision of care. Women and men must have the same responsibility for unpaid housework and have the opportunity to give and receive care on equal terms. Fifth, um, gender equality in the health sector, care and social services. W women and men, girls and boys, must have the same conditions for a good health and to be offered care and social services on equal terms. And finally, this has also been mentioned already as a sixth uh, factor in this. Men's violence against women must stop. Women and men have the same rights and opportunities to physical integrity. So I shouldn't... I will try to avoid to brag about this, because as I said, I don't think we have all the solutions, but I will tell you a little bit about how we have worked in Sweden over the, over the years. How do we get there? To achieve these policy objectives, the Swedish government for several years has applied the strategy of gender mainstreaming. This means that gender factors, gender policies, uh, should be taken into uh, all facets of political life. This means that all policy areas can and must contribute to gender equality. Therefore, all ministers in the Swedish government are responsible for ensuring that a gender equality perspective is included in policy in their respective areas of competence. And the Swedish Minister for General Affairs is responsible for coordinating, developing and following up on those plans. So there is a system for scrutiny in this and that uh, has been important in, in our case. So I'm very proud to, to be standing in for, for the Minister today. A few more things with, with factors that have proven, proven important uh, in our, our context, in our reality. Um, the Swedish historic experience suggests that at least three family-friendly reforms need to be implemented to enable gender equality for women and men, as, work, uh, as well as, as work-life balance throughout the careers. Number one is improvement of the social infrastructure. And this is another way of saying uh, arranging with accessible and affordable childcare and elderly care. I see you're nodding. This has also been brought up, that this is important. If you want to enter the workplace, you need somebody to help you to, to take care of the kids. So this is, is really um, essential. Um, child care, the, the big child care reform was introduced in Sweden as, as early as 1974. And this has been uh, a cornerstone of our policies uh, since then. Number two, abolish joint taxation and introduce separate income taxation for men and women. This we did in 1971. So this has also been established policy for, for many years. And estimates show, of course, that this increases women's labor market participation if you are taxed as an individual, not as uh, only as uh, an appendix to your, your husband, as it was quite often. Um, 
Number three, it's important to introduce parental leave for both parents. This is also part of taking care, sharing responsibility for, for the household and for the children. Both should have uh, a good system for parental leave. Uh, this is a cornerstone for the development of gender equality and women's empowerment. To sum up, experience shows that the more equal a country is, the more stable and economically prosperous it is. So this is, I think, the, the strongest argument for gender equality. It benefits the whole of society also, and, and, and especially in economic terms. Uh, now I will uh, uh, sum up, I'm uh, short of time, or I was uh, quite early on. Uh, I really appreciate the title of this seminar today, this meeting today, the Europe of tomorrow, gender equality and the economy. This implies that uh, there is a great scope for cooperation in this. It's not Sweden or the Czech Republic or any other country doing this individually, but there's great scope for cooperation on this important dossier. And, and for me, being Sweden's ambassador to Prague, it's a privilege uh, and a pleasure to work so closely with the Czech government. With the government and with many NGOs. And we are comparing notes quite often with the Czech Republic. Public. There's a good case for doing so. We are 10.5 million inhabitants in Sweden, quite as many as, as the Czech Republic here. And we are constantly comparing notes and trying to learn from each other. Benchmarking. Sometimes we learn from you, and other, on other occasions we can learn, teach the Czech Republic something. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Thank you all for your inspirational speeches. Now I would like to open the first panel on gender equality and economic recovery. So if I can ask the first speakers in the first panel to join us and thanks a lot to everyone. Thank you. This panel is focusing on the post-pandemic economic recovery from Okay, so we will have we will have a little pause, like a few minutes pause, and then we will start the first panel. So you can do whatever you want, and then please gather here for the first panel.
Okay, so let me open this first uh, panel on gender equality and economic recovery, post-pandemic economic recovery from the gender equality perspective. The panel discussion will be hosted by Mr. Reka Shafrani, the president of the European Women's Lobby. Welcome. And Reka will be joined by Ms. Uh, Milena Angelova, European Economic and Social Committee. Welcome. Ms. Rosella Benedetti, Vice President of the ETUC Women's Committee. Welcome. Ms. Valentina Cirella, Country People and Culture Manager from IKEA. Welcome. Ms. Karlin Schiele, Director of the European Institute for Gender Equality. Welcome. And last but not least, uh, Maria Sirengela, Deputy Minister of Labour and Social Affairs, responsible for demography, family and gender equality from Greece. Welcome. Reka, it's yours. Thank you. Uh, I would like to welcome you all, ladies and gentlemen, who came uh, to see this panel. And uh, I would also like to welcome our honourable guests. Um, the, what has been said before uh, is very, very important for our panel as well. Uh, our main topic is gender equality and economic recovery. Um, the pandemic has threatened to derail uh, decades of uh, one hard-won progress in uh, fighting gender inequality, uh, unfortunately. Um, we are now in a post-pandemic uh, recovery um, uh, period, but unfortunately uh, the EU has entered this uh, phase uh, and immediately it's been hit by a sharp uh, rise in inflation and commodity prices. Uh, especially following uh, Russia's invasion in Ukraine. Uh, the dire economic situation which we face at the moment uh, will determine uh, how uh, the government will respond and that response uh, has a very um, long-term uh, impact uh, on how we become a green and more resilient uh, society. I would say that all these uh, effects, all these crises, have had a uh, disproportionately negative impact on women and on uh, gender, in, uh, in gender equality, unfortunately. Uh, only as we think of the uh, energy poverty uh, issues that have arisen and will arise, uh, we are reminded by, uh, by women's uh, vulnerability to these situations. Uh, so, in today's panel, I would like to uh, ask our uh, guests, uh, our panelists, to please talk about their respective fields and uh, how uh, they would recommend, uh, what um, findings they have had at European level, at national level, uh, about these issues, and how they recommend uh, going on um, to build a more resilient uh, and gender equal society for the future. Uh, and with that, I would like to ask uh, Milena Angelova to please take the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, distinguished participants. It is really with a very great joy and excitement that I stand today before you, as gender equality is indeed the only future for Europe. Therefore, I congratulate the Czech Presidency for placing gender equality high in their priorities and for organizing this high-level event. There is no doubt how detrimental is any situation where a person is not seen equal to others because of gender or other personal characteristics. Endemic discrimination, including gender discrimination, is a major cause for people being left behind. As already highlighted by the Minister Lonvi Rome, gender equality is rooted in the European values and eliminating inequalities and prom promoting equality between men and women requires a holistic and horizontal approach. The Czech Presidency requested from the European Economic and Social Committee as advisory body to the European Union an exploratory opinion on gender equality and tools and measures to enhance it from several points of view. <laughs> so just, uh, so it's, it's fine, but just perhaps to, to fix it and then to continue. Will it move again? 
Is it fine like this? Okay, let's hope. Let's hope not move. So uh, we uh, took uh, different perspectives to, um, the, uh, to the analysis that we undertook on what will be the avenues to further enhance the gender equality because we are not at the ideal situation across Europe. And we analyzed the post-pandemic uh, um, situation, the recovery and employment, the empowerment of young people, education and skills, entrepreneurship and corporate leadership, work-life balance, as well as uh, the issue of migration and refugees, including due to the war of Ukraine. Then uh, we at uh, the European Economic and Social Committee stressed to the fact that success in uh, enhancing gender equality in a sustainable way lies in nurturing a lifelong gender equality culture that goes through each and every phase of life cycle and provides measure tailored to the specific characteristics and needs of every stage of life. Uh, I heard the same concept also shared by Ambassador Jorgensen, uh, but still we want to stress that being a matter of culture, it, uh, the gender equality cannot be brought only by means of single policies and measures, but requires recognition, ownership and constant co commitment of all actors of the society. A lifelong gender equality culture must be cultivated starting from early childhood and setting example in the family, uh, continuing throughout nursery and throughout all school stages. The same concept was brought uh, by Deputy Prime Minister Bartosz, and I'm happy that our conclusions are shared. Children's integration into society starts as early as the kids are starting going to crash. Therefore, these types of facilities have to develop strong lifelong gender equality culture and training. The simple fact that many of the workers there are female creates a stereotype in a children's mind that this is only women who take care for the kids. The same is valid also for every task performed by female mainly. This silo should be removed. For example, nurturing the children's interest according to STEM should be subject on the mental uh, attitude and how the brain operates and not subject to what gender is a person. And uh, th this is the only way really to unleash the potential of uh, kids at a very early stage of life. In addition to these knowledge aspects, it is equally important to ensure that children and young people obtain social and other necessary skills and develop um, emotional intelligence in a gender neutral manner without imposing any pigeonholing or prejudices. This also applies to breaking any appearance-related stereotypes to the gender. The ESC calls on the member states through education policies to enhance gender-neutral teaching with res respect to both knowledge and social skills, as well as learning contexts free from gender stereotypes. To sustain lifelong gender equality culture further, gender equality needs to be fostered in economic and social activities, including in businesses, public services, and political life. So we believe that keeping gender equality up systematically in various contexts is necessary mean to move forward. Therefore, we recommend to the member states, together with the European Commission, social partners and relevant civil society organizations to launch a wide-ranging information and awareness raising campaigns to promote lifelong gender equality culture, where special attention should be paid to the central role of both traditional and social media as platforms for shaping attitudes. The campaign should draw decision makers' attention to the state and progress of gender equality into the member states and encourage the member states to seek inspiration from each other and to share good practices. Political actors, decision makers and public organizations should also lead by example and enhance gender equality in their own activities. Gender equality in terms of uh, participation in uh, political decision making and national, regional and municipal level is crucial considering the impact of political decisions on citizens' life. Increasing the share of female politicians 
at all levels requires strengthening the awareness of voters as well as of parties nominating candidates and fostering a culture of, that encourages and enables women to take active part in political life. As the improvement of gender equality requires measures to be introduced at several policy levels, the EC reiterates its call to policymakers to uh, follow the principle of gender mainstreaming and include gender equality aspects in all decisions, including those on budgeting, investment and funding, and in public procurement. Considering the challenges caused by aging population and the need to encourage a skilled workforce, the inclusiveness of labor markets is even more important. The removal of any obstacles and provision of incentives for overall increase of participation of women in labor markets irrespective of their profession, task or age, is therefore for us crucial. For example, flexible working arrangements, parental leaves, taxation and other kinds of incentives play a role in enhancing gender equality. In addition to the legislative frameworks, the practical modalities should be laid down using the possibilities for collective bargaining between the social partners. As the post-pandemic recovery needs to take place in line with the green and digital skills, STEM competences are even more essential. From the point of view of gender equality and prevention of segregation, it is important to attract girls to study more STEM subjects, while also attracting more boys to study and apply to care for care and education professions. These aspects should be embedded in career guidance and staff retention measures. While the COVID pandemic affected both women and men, the impacts were felt different and the effects of the crisis risk jeopardizing the progress achieved in the past in terms of reducing the gender inequalities in the member states. Besides affecting work-life balance, as already pointed, the pandemic has, has hit women harder through job losses of uh, temporary unemployment and uh, uh, the sectors that were dominated uh, by women were mostly hard hit by the pandemic. So, also many factors related to gender equality are dependent on national social infrastructure, which plays a very important role in gaining higher participation in labor market and better work-life work, work balance. As already mentioned by the Vice President Yurova, it's very important to have a supportive care system as from the early age of the kids, and therefore we are looking forward to discussing further the care strategy published recently by the Commission. One specific aspect to address is the gender bias in healthcare due to lack of research, male-centric education, misdiagnosis and undertreatment. Ignorance of sex and gender-based differences across medical discipline leads to incorrect diagnosis and also causes female symptoms uh, to uh, be uh, mis uh, disregarded. This is also uh, due to lack of research for female specific conditions and gender disaggregated data. So this is another expert aspect that should, shall be taken into, uh, into consideration. From the point of uh, view uh, for gender equality to contribute further to economic recovery and resilience, it's very important that female part uh, entrepreneurship is further promoted. To that extent, we call that uh, uh, all the financing measures are easily accessible and they are gender neutral and that they uh, really promote uh, the participation of female interpreters. To that extent, also we call for uh, member states, business organizations and so social partners to promote women's leadership and launch training and mentoring programs targeted at female leaders and candidates for directory, uh, directors or managerial positions in public organizations or for board and senior execu executive provisions in business, trade unions and private organizations. We also call for pre proper attention to be paid to gender equality when we address the issue of Ukrainian refugees. This applies to support children to access care and uh, schooling to help women integrate smoothly into the labor markets via quality employment and to provide them access to sexual and reproductive health services as well. To conclude, I would like to underline that achieving gender equality is only possible as a joint commitment and constant endeavor of all political leaders 
and decision makers across Europe at national, regional and local level, together with social partner, with civil society organization and all the interested stakeholders. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Angalova, for your uh, important contribution and uh, for pointing out that uh, the life cycle approach is so very important and also a comprehensive approach across all these fields. Uh, not only that, but the cooperation among uh, EU member states is the key to achieving these uh, points. Uh, with that, I would like to ask uh, our next speaker um, to uh, Rosella Benedetti, uh, Vice President of the ETUC Women's Committee, to please um, present it, um, your introductory uh, speech from the trade union's perspective. Thank you. If you don't mind, I would like to sit down. It's, uh, I find it uh, easier to speak this way. Uh, I want, first of all, to thank uh, the Czech presidency for this invitation. It was much appreciated. And for this timely discussion on gender equality, equality and economic recovery. Uh, these panel discussions, as everyone uh, has already said, comes at a time in which Europe is hit by multiple crises. It is difficult to discuss the economic recovery in times of an escalating cost uh, of living crisis triggered by the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the war in a time in which workers do not know how to pay their bills. As in every crisis, women workers are particularly affected. As, the for, as for the COVID crisis, it is necessary to deliver a gender responsive plan to tackle the costs of living crisis. We need to, to take bold decisions and value women's jobs as well as facilitate girls' participation in STEM and ICT labor market. If anyone believed that gender equality was close to being achieved, the pandemic has led bare the realities. Systemic inequalities that are built into numerous aspects of women's lives, from pay, employment, and work-life balance to safety at work and in the home, have been reinforced. Moreover, while the previous economic crisis had swept many men's jobs away, this one has hit women particularly hard. To achieve gender equality, especially in a view to support lasting recovery, we need to focus first, on all, uh, first of all on two dimensions. Violence and harassment in the world of work and equal pay. According to the A2C survey conducted with European Women Trade Unionists in March 2021, 84% of respondents said that the employers had not updated their policies to address online harassment associated with telework. 77% of respondents thought that employers did not, did not do enough to tackle violence and harassment at work, including online. 84% of respondents thought that national laws were not strong enough to tackle violence and harassment at work, including online. 83% of respondents did not believe their country's laws to tackle violence and harassment at work, including online, were ad adequately enforced. A majority of respondents indicated they were concerned on or even very concerned about violence and harassment at work online and offline. The A2C Women's Committee sees an urgent need for employers to step up their efforts and protect women workers from all forms of violence and harassment in the world of work, including online violence and third party violence. Of course, we appreciated the the proposal for a directive to combat violence against women and domestic violence, but which was published on 8 March 2022. Uh, it might be useful if properly amended. While the existence of this directive is certainly a step in the right direction, the A2C Women's Committee finds that the draft proposal doesn't make workplaces safer for women workers, as it lacks practical solutions that involve trade unions. 
The proposal fails to include trade unions, specifically health and safety representatives, collective bargaining or social dialogue. Despite the fact that collective bargaining is a proven method to make workplaces safer and to support and protect victims and survivors of sexual harassment and domestic violence. Just to give an example, the proposal entails a provision that calls for specialist support for victims of sexual harassment at work, at Article 30. The HEC Women's Committee will be very active to ensure that this provision is amended. It must be ensured that counselling services also take into account cyber violence and third-party violence too. Counselling services are available only to workers, not to employers. Employers have to pay for these external counselling services and that workers must be granted time off to attend these services. Workers shall have the right to receive support and representation from their trade union and to have access to information on available remedies and access to legal remedies. Stronger safeguards are also needed when it comes to online abuse. Telework has shown us that just because someone is working from home, that doesn't mean that they are safe from violence and harassment at work. I'll give you another example. I'm a teacher. Teachers have been hit hard by online abuse during the pandemic. And no one was ready to defend them or to prevent students and family to do that or other people uh, that could get access to online teaching uh, uh, as well. Importantly, the directive should also provide that victims of cyber violence, such as revenge porn, are protected, protected against indirect and direct discrimination from the side of an employer. Sexual harassment in the world of work harms women's ability to participate fully in the labor market and earn a living. That's been said. This is also true for computer crimes, forms of violence against women facilitated by digital means. The draft proposal leaves economic harm as a result of violence against women and, and domestic violence largely out of sight. And I would also like to stress the need to urgently ratify the ILO Convention 119. That's a not topic for us. More support is needed to push for the ratification all member states, uh, from all member states of the ILO Convention 190 to eradicate violence and harassment in the world of work. This is the first international labor standard, uh, standard to address violence and harassment in the world of work. It is surprising to see European Commission's lack of support for the Convention with the Council decision authorizing Member States to ratify ILO 119 still pending, the EU is disempowering Member States to ratify the Convention. Only Italy, Greece and Spain have ratified so far. We have recently launched a petition to push to unblock ratification of ILO 119. I urge you to join this petition to add your voice in order to make it a success. So, and after that, I have to speak about equal pay. It was already said that there is uh, an ongoing process. Women's contribution to growth has been always underestimated. They not only ensure almost all the unpaid care work, but the jobs they are in are often underpaid. Although they hold high qualification, are often discriminated at work because of pregnancies or other family burdens. The HUC Women's Committee has been very active in pushing for the Pay Transparency Directive that is currently being discussed in trialogues under the Czech presidency. And we hope that the process will uh, see an end, a quick end, uh, and a positive end. Without going too much into detail, this directive must draw the right lessons from the COVID pandemic. We need to finally enforce the right of equal pay for work of equal value as enshrined in the treaties since 1957. It's women workers who kept our societies afloat during the pandemic. Cleaners, cashiers, care workers, nurses, teachers, these jobs are still undervalued. 
This needs to change and the directive can make a big step in, in this direction. And the HEC will continue, of course, to lobby for ambitious pay transparency directive that safeguards every women workers' choice to join a union and empowers unions to negotiate collective agreements that deliver equal pay for work of equal value and meaningful pay transparency measures. I also underline the need to make sweet progress. That's what I've just said in the trilogues. Women workers cannot wait any longer for women for equal pay. And I stop it here because the time is up, I think, for me. Thank you. Thank you very much for emphasizing the trade unions uh, uh, aspects and all these uh, important issues, especially uh, the harassment uh, and violence aspect and how it affects other areas and the equal pay uh, aspect and how the pay transparency uh, can give a good solution uh, in this uh, regard. Um, I would like to ask uh, then our next speaker, uh, Valentina uh, Cirella, uh, can country people and culture manager from IKEA to please give her speech. Thank you. Sure. Uh, good morning and thank you very much for this invitation. I have a presentation because in companies we like presentations very much. So allow me to use a few slides to guide you through what we are doing or trying to do on uh, equality in different dimensions. And first of all, I would like to welcome you using the same words we use every day to welcome new co-workers in our company. Because equality is at the heart of everything we do, and we strongly believe that a better every day is also an equal every day, uh, at work, at home, and everywhere in between. And uh, um, it has already been mentioned, so I can only echo some of the interventions that um, recent big events have completely changed our lives, our habits, our needs, also as consumers and uh, as employees. And what we can also see in our reality is that women have paid and still pay a higher price for this. And uh, I can only briefly mention, obviously, looking for a work-life balance, uh, uh, being or feeling themselves uh, uh, reasonably to be the, the main caregivers in the family. And uh, uh, just mentioning the very high percentage of refugees uh, fleeing from Ukraine because of the war, they are women, and in many cases they have kids with them. Um, we believe that uh, contributing to a more fair and equal life and society is the right thing to do, but for us it makes also business sense. And I would like to explain you briefly why. Because a diverse and inclusive workplace is the key to attract the best talents in the job market. And at the same time, have a diverse workforce allow us to work better on our succession plans and develop new skills, new competencies that are highly uh, required. We talked briefly before, uh, not briefly, about digitalization and uh, new digital skills. That's definitely something we are looking for. On the other hand, we know that to attract diverse people, we must offer working conditions that fit with their needs. And this is our role, to create uh, the best possible environment where these diverse talent can grow and develop. And, um, and we know also that a diverse and inclusive organization contributes to customer loyalty and can increase our customer base. And, uh, because consumers obviously prefer to shop from meaningful brands they can trust. Uh, so I would like to go through briefly a uh, four dimension we have hardly worked on, still working on. Uh, I would like to start with gender equality. For us, gender equality is not only a percentage of, or a number. We are proud to say that in our organization, and I work for three main countries, Czech Republic, Hungary and Slovakia, we are internally almost balanced in all managerial groups, uh, in, in different functions, in different units, and we are proud of that. And also when it comes to the global level of our company, we can say the same almost in every country. Uh, but we try to do something more, to go a little bit deeper, and so we run 
several different kind of surveys to understand the connection between this percentage and the sense of belonging, motivation, engagement of our female and men colleagues uh, in our work environment. And what we found out, it, and it's the, the, the good surprise, is that we are also balanced there. And in some cases, for example, when it comes to women working for our company for more than one or two years, they are even higher motivated than uh, their male colleagues. But we know there are still many challenges, and many of them have already been mentioned, so I will uh, probably repeat something. Um, many challenges for women when it comes to uh, having a career or deciding to take more responsibilities. Uh, what we have done, we have run focus groups uh, with some of our colleagues in the different units, in the different realities we have in our company, and these are the main areas that we have identified together. So, um, women are the main caregivers, which means that in many cases they still feel they have to choose between a career or having a family. And uh, no matter how we hard work to offer good working condition, it still happens that in our reality we are not able to fit with their needs. And so they feel they would need something different to, uh, to take more responsibility and to be able to feel comfortable in a managerial role. And in some other cases, uh, they feel they are not enough, not enough competent, not enough ready to take higher roles, to take these managerial roles. And for that, they would like to have some support. It has already been mentioned, uh, mentorship, some senior manager maybe helping them, supporting them, showing their success, but also their failures. And uh, last but not least, we know that good leaders can make the difference, but also bad leaders do. And uh, a second dimension is gender equal pay, just mentioned and so important for us. I would like to tell you briefly how we are working with this. So last year we have run our third year of assessment supported by KPMG. And the criteria that we have used is that uh, we have assessed the whole IKEA population, uh, which is quite big all around the world. And uh, so the criteria was that every time that we found a gap higher than 5% in the salary for the same role within the same function between a man and, and a woman, we had investigated that. And if the reason behind this gap was linked, was not linked, sorry, to performance or competence or legal requirement, we took actions. And in our region, last year, 2021, we identified 5% of these cases. We investigated all of them. And when the reasons behind that was not one of the three that I just mentioned, we took actions and we did something to uh, obviously increase where the salary was lower than expected. Um, a third dimension, very, very important for us, is addressing violence against women and girls. We believe is a, uh, a joint effort to which we are strongly committed. We have a zero tolerance policy in our company, also when it comes to sexual harassment uh, in the workplace. And in Czech Republic especially, we have run a campaign which had a quite a strong echo both internally and externally. Internally, we have focused mainly on education of our leaders and our co-workers. We have also provided direct help for counseling and reporting, and we have offered extra days to the victims, victims of violence. And externally, we are working, because we're still doing that, with NGOs and public stakeholders in order to achieve a better legal environment to support the victims of domestic abuse. Uh, one last, but definitely not less important dimension is linked to a project that we have been able to run for, uh, is now entering in the third year, thanks to the support of the European Commission, which is called Skills for Employment. Through this program, we have helped many refugees to gain more competencies, language, cultural, in some cases specific skills to enter um, the, the job market. Not only joining our company, but also other companies. And this is the way we would like to proceed. And um, 
thanks to this program, we have welcomed in our region 51 um, new co-workers. And for this year, 2022-23, we have a plan to hire 32 more. And obviously, we work also outside of this program, but this one is definitely the richest one that we have. Um, and just to close, as I started, I would like to share a sentence that we often use uh, when we talk with our leaders. We know that the, the role of leaders is so important to create that environment that we are all, I think, talking about somehow in society, but also in the companies where everyone can feel themselves and they can contribute with their uniqueness. And this is a way we believe we can create a better IKEA, but also a better society. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, presenting the business case for gender equality, uh, but also uh, to remind us of the very well-known um, initiative of IKEA to help domestic violence victims uh, uh, during the pandemic. So thank you very much. Uh, with that, I would like to ask uh, Karlin uh, Skiele, the Director of the uh, European Institute for Gender Equality, to pre pre present your research and data on the socioeconomic aspects of the pandemic. Thank you. And um, you set the trend. I will also stay and sit in my seat, if you don't mind. <laughs> so, good morning. It's a real pleasure for me to be here with you today. I would also like to, to uh, thank the Czech Presidency for inviting me. And, um, well, I'm not going to repeat what has said be before, although, yeah, let me say it again, is that the, the pandemic, of, of course, has affected us in more than one way. Uh, we all know that. Two years later, our, our focus has again shifted, but life as we knew, well, it has completely changed. Now, before I dive into IGES knowledge base, base, which is based on the most recent data and research on the socio-economic impact of the pandemic on gender equality, I want you to know that the gender impact of the pandemic and I'm really convinced of this, should be treated as a temporary glitch. That's to say, I strongly believe that it's not too late, really not too late, to reverse the regression and put ourselves back on the path of progression. If only you remember what uh, Vice President Jourova, uh, what she told us this morning, how many policies the Commission has launched, um, of course, I know it's paper, but still, um, I see this as a very positive uh, time slot. A lot is going on. And of course, we have to closely work together to make it a reality. But let's also try to be positive when it concerns the future. But of course, we have to join our forces, and there's a lot to be done. First, um, we need to know where we currently stand and why we stand there. And let me take you back to a typical day not too long ago during the height of lockdown. And I'm sure that many of you recognize what I'm going to describe. So there's this family of two parents and three children in the living room of their two-bedroom apartment. That living room has been divided up into many makeshift spaces. An office for the parents, a primary school for the twins, a daycare for the two-year-old, and with whatever space remains is a place to eat, relax, or watch TV. There's so much going on at the same time, it's really overwhelming. And while many in this scenario did their best to make a difficult situation a little less difficult by rising to the occasion and equalizing their share of responsibilities, we actually, and that's important to stress again, it was said this morning, we, but we saw a rise in something else, a rise in pre-existing gender differences. And I will tell you um, what we learned from IGES COVID-19 survey from 2021. It revealed that the pandemic led to more intense childcare demands for parents, particularly those with jobs. Nearly one-fifth 
of working parents have spent more time on childcare during the pandemic than before, 20%. But more than half of women with, with small children say they are completely or mostly responsible for childcare in their household. That's 50%. It's, it's an incredible amount. And as you can imagine, responsibilities are never in isolation. Life just doesn't work like that. Childcare sits alongside other demands like housework or long-term unpaid care. It all adds up. And if it's not shared equally, it becomes a pressure cooker. During the pandemic, we found that the distribution of house, household cores between partners changed, with most women reporting having a higher share of housework on their plate. Imagine doing the grocery shopping, the cleaning, the laundry, an important work project, then taking care of homeschooling and then cooking dinner. And just when you could really do with a break for yourself, a relative with an ongoing illness requires care. Your hands are tied. And, and that's for two parent families. Imagine the toll on single parent families. Right now there are six million single parents in the European Union, where most of them are women. Six million. It's an incredible, again, an incredible amount. Thankfully, it was already mentioned, the proposed EU care strategy has come at the right time to address these issues and hopefully help lighten the load for everyone with an action plan for affordable early childhood education and care, as well accessible, high quality, long-term care. We need robust care systems in place where external support is given as an option because then it offers more freedom of choice to lead a fuller life. Like a choice to re-engage with a passion project or attend social activities. While domestic duties are still carried out, where partners have a more realistic chance to share care. In fact, our survey showed that both women and men report higher satisfaction rates when childcare is shared equally with their partner. So you see, legislation is needed. I've given you just a small taster here today. The impact of the pandemic on care is a focus in our upcoming index report, this year's report, our annual measure of the EU's progress towards gender equality, which is going to be further unpacked at IGES, first ever gender equality forum on 24 and 25 October, both in person in Brussels and via web streaming. You can find out more details on our social media channels and I would really like to invite you to attend um, virtually. It's a great opportunity to, to participate. And now let's turn to the generation of tomorrow, the youth, who are worried about what tomorrow is going to look like because of what today looks like. I painted you a picture of what a typical family went through in the pandemic. Now, let me do the same for a fresh university graduate. By day, they work at the salon, by night at the bar. They scrape whatever time they have in between to send off job applications. It's not an ideal situation, but they've got the drive and energy to make it work. I'm sure you can recall that relentless determination at the beginning of your career. At any given point in time, it's a challenge for young people to get their foot in the door, not least when all the dorms see, seem to be slamming shut all at once, where overnight dreams are dashed, hope is flat, and uncertainty seems like the only certainty. And that's exactly what happened in the pandemic. IGES' forthcoming policy brief on the youth presents a unanimous conclusion. Young women and men were hit the hardest. And yet, the youth are the ones who have to face the future more than any of us. But what we saw in the fallout of the pandemic is that existing inequalities between women and men were aggravated. Take the gender barriers in the labor market as an example, it was said before. Even though young women continue to achieve high levels of education, 
the employment rate of women who have recently graduated from tertiary education remains lower than men. That impact is even greater for women with a migrant background who experienced a greater increase in unemployment during the pandemic. Also, again, said before, the pay gap still exists and now persists and then widens with age, causing a precarious ripple effect into pension years. For a generation who want to be architects of change, this reality won't support their dreams. Solutions need to help galvanize the youth into action. At our forum that I mentioned before, we will have young people to speak with them, to, to look at the challenges that they are facing, and we have to be active listeners. And these solutions need to keep gender equality in focus, both in policy and in practice. I began by saying that the pandemic has affected us in more ways than one. I want to book it that, to book bookend that, by saying we need to understand the different ways the pandemic has affected different groups of people for a successful recovery, for both our economies and our societies. I want to stress again how important it is to take an intersectional approach in our policies. Different groups in societies have been affected and are still affected differently. It is up to us to bridge gender gaps and to move forward together towards a stronger, more resilient and inclusive economy. And I'm excited to see so many, bri many brilliant minds and can doers here today under this roof, who no doubt can lead the charge for change. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Skelly, for uh, giving such a lively uh, account of your survey results uh, so that we can really uh, uh, picture uh, these scenarios very well and for giving a message of hope and uh, positivity. Uh, I would like to ask um, uh, Maria Sirangela, Deputy uh, Minister of Labour and Social Affairs, to please um, say uh, your speech and, and uh, reflect on the national level uh, actions that we can take. Thank you. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the Czech Presidency for the organization of uh, this event. Uh, it is uh, true that uh, crisis uh, affects groups of people who are most vulnerable or already discriminated against. Unfortunately, women still remain in this position and uh, the successive crisis we are facing, not only in Europe, but also globally, cause a regression in the achievements of gender equality. Policy makers, uh, we must take action so that gender equality remains high on the political agendas and improves the everyday life of all citizens. The exploratory um, opinion requested by the Czech presidency on gender equality covers all key areas and provides the basic guidelines for states to take targeted actions in order to create a lifelong culture based on gender equality, which in my opinion is very helpful. In Greece, the COVID-19 crisis and the, uh, the economic and social crisis created difficult conditions, especially for women who are already struggling in many areas of economic and social life. To address the economic and social impact of the pandemic, Greece, as many other European states, has submitted its National Recovery and Resilience Plan, which is in, in alignment with the National Action Plan on Gender Equality uh, of uh, the European Union and of uh, the UN Agenda 2030. The plan is structured and out four pillars, green transition, digital transformation, employment uh, skills and social cohesion, private investment and transformation of the economy. And of course, it includes policies and measures with uh, regard uh, the gathered perspective in close interconnection with an action action plan on uh, gender equality. Uh, focusing on, G uh, on green transition on, on one of our proposed programs within the Greek uh, RRF, Recovery and Resilience Fund, is the Green Jobs Initiative. Uh, which aims to support the transition to a green economy by subsidizing the creation of new jobs at businesses with an emphasis on unemployed women. 
Also on mainstreaming gender environment, we have conducted for the first time in collaboration with the OECD a study on the empowerment of women in the transition to green development and green jobs in Greece. And this study reviews national environmental uh, policies and strategies with a gender lens, as well as national gender equality policies with an environmental lens. Uh, of course, highlights gaps and possible synergies into the country and with other countries and proposes a series of recommendations that, if taken on board, could support integrating the gender uh, environment nexus into Greece's national uh, policies. Uh, our main tool in Greece is to empower women and girls in order to be at the front line. Uh, and uh, this is already mentioned in the national action plan that we have on gender uh, equality. The action plan is structured in four axes, preventing and combating gender-based and domestic violence, uh, equal participation of women in decision-making processes, equal participation of women in the labour market, and of course, as the Swedish ambassador already said, gender mainstreaming in sectoral policies. For the first time, every ministry has a, a direct plan with, the, uh, with a gender dimension. Based on the structure of the action plan, these targeted actions are aimed at changing attitudes and eliminating gender stereotypes. Uh, we continuously implement uh, initiatives that enable the combination of family, personal life and work life, promote equal pay. In Greece, we are under the... Mm, uh, we, we, we don't have too much uh, gap, uh, uh, pay gap, because we have many women working in the public sector. So in the public sector, everybody earns the same salary, men and women. Uh, of course, combat uh, the gendered stereotypes at their workplace. We have already um, ratified the ILO Convention, as, we, as you already said, uh, for, the, uh, for the violence and harassment in the world of uh, work. And now every company, not only the big ones, but uh, also the middle, uh, the middle ones have uh, uh, codes for preventing and eliminating the phenomenon. Enhance the education and the specialization of women and girls in research and technology at every educational level. For this reason, we had an innovation lab for women, and it is in cooperation with uh, the Ministry of Education, with research centres, with universities, of course with the women branches of uh, all the uh, economic and uh, branches. Um, uh, and at the same time we, co we cooperate with the, the Norwegian Innovation Lab. Uh, so, we implemented a series of actions to promote uh, uh, this balance and decrease women's interrupted uh, career. We have a, a program, a new program called the Neighborhood Nannies uh, for totals up to two and a half years. Uh, we uh, have childcare units in, uh, within the large companies. It is one of the programs in the RRF, uh, uh, in the Greek RRF. And uh, we have a, a, an implementation of the quality label in companies. And of course, the last law that incorporates into the national law, the directive of the European Parliament and of the Council on the work-life balance for parents and carers. And this hard work is illustrated. We had the reduction of 5% uh, in the women's unemployment from uh, nine to 2019 to, to on December two, uh, 2021. And uh, of course, uh, it is, we have a lot of work to do, but uh, this is, was something very good because, as you know, uh, Greece had uh, the biggest uh, unemployment in women. Uh, moreover, for the first time in 2022, Greece is among the 12 states which collect the score of 100% uh, 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 regarding legal equality between women and men. Uh, and allow me to, to, to conclude by highlighting the importance of women in decision-making positions. Although it is a global issue and despite the uh, historic victories of women in the international uh, uh, community, the main idea uh, unfortunately uh, remains unchangeable. Internationally, our country included, it is believed that women are capable for and suitable for wives and mothers, for, but incapable for decision-making positions. And we need to change uh, this narrative. We need more women in decision-making positions. We need more women whose voice is being heard. 
Uh, and last but not, but not least, I would like to say that there will be no real democracy, there will be no real social just, justice, no real development, not only for a country, for the, for the for European Union, without the participation of women which, uh, are, who are the half of our population. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, dear Deputy Minister uh, Sirangela, for uh, presenting such a lively um, uh, account of uh, the, what you can do at national level, uh, the good practices from Greece uh, uh, in the area of um, gender equality. Uh, with all these inspirations uh, that we have received from our speakers, I would like to uh, um, open the floor for a, more of a discussion among yourselves. Uh, First, I would have maybe a few questions to you, and then uh, we would be happy to take uh, questions from the audience online and both in, in person. Uh, so, as you have all mentioned, the uh, effects of the pandemic um, on uh, gender equality uh, in Europe, if you have anything still in, in mind uh, about that, uh, you're welcome to also uh, throw that in, but uh, I was also thinking uh, it's important to take the next uh, step and ask uh, what could the EU and the member states uh, take, what measures can they uh, make to ensure sustainable and resilient uh, economic growth that will benefit both women and men, girls and boys. So may I ask you first, uh, <laughs> as you are next to me, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, of course, I'll go straight to the second question because I think the first one I already answered uh, before. Uh, we have, as Women's Committee, a, a clear roadmap for ensuring a gender responsive reco recovery. Uh, we are calling for more support for trade unions so that they can spearhead the, the fight for gender equality. When women join together in the trade union, they can bargain for a better deal, increase the pay, more security, training, health and safety, and say, over working hours, fairer promotions, more paid leave and a decent pension. And these are all big issues, but uh, that's what we do during collective bargaining. So if you support collective bargaining and you support women in trade unions, you can have all these results. Of course, we, 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 we are very much uh, committed uh, to get equal pay throughout Europe, as we said before. Without the effective actions, the gender gap in the EU won't close until uh, 2104, that's a lot of time, it's, um, I'll be dead uh, and my children will uh, be retired, so it's a lot of time, really a lot of time before we can get that. So we are calling for improved legislation, including the EU Directive on Adequate Minimum Wages and the EU Directive on Pay Transparency to guarantee pay equality, including an obligation on employers to collectively bargain on measures to close the pay gap and uh, unfortunately the vice minister has to leave for a, a little while but I, I can say that public services uh, uh, on the whole uh, people working public services seem to have uh, the same uh, the same pay but in the end since women have to go on part-time for family burdens, in the end they do not get the same salary and the worst, they do not get the same pensions. So a lot of women are at risk of poverty during, uh, uh, after they retire. So uh, we, we, we also uh, uh, are striving to get the pay justice for essential workers at the art of recovery. I, I mentioned it for, before. A lot of women were on the front line during COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of them. I just mentioned a few ones, a few, a few profiles by working profiles, but we have more than that. And most of those women are working in precarious conditions, so they haven't been hired at the end of COVID pandemic. Most of them have been laid off. On the contrary, so 
we, we, we need pay justice uh, uh, and we need also uh, working conditions of justice in that. So we need to earmark resources on pensions, address the past, so as I said before, address the past discrimination that has left all the women particularly affected by the gender pay gap as it affects the, their pensions, leaving uh, uh, many at risk of extreme and persistent po poverty once they have reached retirement age. We have to end stereotypes, reinforce funding from the national recovery plans to challenge stereotypes and to increase opportunities for women in new technologies. It has been said, it has been called for before digitalization and green transition, put in place financial and other support for women to change careers and for girls to undertake studies in non-traditional fields. And we need to end online of life violence and harassment at work. We need to stop violence against women and girls in all its forms because in the end uh, makes them live work and makes them poorer. We need to combat the backlash against women's rights. We are very worried about that. The growing backlash against long fought for, women, long fought for women's rights fueled by the false narratives of the far right must be put to a halt. Women's safety and their sexual and reproductive health and rights are not up for debate. Uh, we, we, we need to make a work-life balance a reality. The directive was a step forward, but the fact is that when you, you, you go on a parental leave and you get only 30% or a very, a very small part of your salary, then uh, who is going to, get, to go on a parental leave? The one in the family who has uh, the lowest salary and most of the time are women. And Think about, as Carlene has said, of all the six million single parents that cannot afford parental leave. And they even don't get the right services to help them keep their works. So we need to develop a world-class infrastructure of care that is much needed. And someone has said it before, this is not a cost, this is an investment because then people can go back to work, can keep their jobs, they can produce, they can support growth. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, may I please ask uh, um, Director uh, Scala to carry on with other issues that she thinks are important in this respect? Well, part of the title is of this, uh, this panel is economic recovery. And, and I, I would sincerely, sincerely hope that member states do see that um, to get out of the crisis and to, to recover economically, you simply cannot ignore gender equality. And um, it has been said by, by some of the speakers this morning, that the costs of, um, let's say, Gen, gender equality insensitivity. I would like to add another figure just to show um, what are the economic costs, for example, of domestic violence. We, we estimated at IGA that this is 366 billion euros per year in the European Union. So my hope is that now that we have this great instrument that the Commission launched, uh, the RRF facility, Recovery and Resilience Facility, I sincerely hope that the member states um, overall have taken gender equality into account while drafting these uh, plans. They have they have been uh, let's say checked by the by the European Commission. They have been approved by the European Commission. I I take it that there was also a gender equality check <laughs> when this uh, check uh, by the Commission took place. But I think that member states. Um, if they take this dimension into account, I have big hopes for this RRF facility, recovery and resilience facility. Um, you know, gender equality is too often, and I say nothing new here, but, but what I have heard often in the past was that people said, yeah, but let's now first solve this crisis, and then where the hard topics have been, have been solved, let's then again go back to gender equality. Yeah? Um, that talk about equality between women and men, we can do it at a later stage. And I, I feel that now with all the instruments that the Commission has launched, um, discussions that are taking place at national level, 
data that are available, like the ones that my own institute provides, but also the Fundamental Rights Agency in Vienna, there is so much information available, really so much information available. And that's why I also wanted to share a message of also a little bit of hope. Because I think that the infrastructure is really there, but, but member states, governments should really take this issue seriously. They can no longer ignore it. You mentioned very briefly the gender equality backlash. I would like to say a few words here as well. Because of course this backlash is not new. I mean, we have seen this rise in, in the past 10, 10, 15 years. And I think it's also, I mean, the anti-gender movements and, and become more and more vocal. Maybe we can take this also a little bit, although I don't ignore how um, hateful they are and awful they are. Maybe we can take it also a little bit as a compliment, because the more vocal we become on gender equality and the relevance of gender equality, and the same goes, goes for human rights, um, of course, the more obvious these anti-gender movements are. But also there, it's important to understand how to counteract those narratives. And maybe I can mention here two products that IG will launch soon. Uh, one we will launch before the forum that I mentioned, uh, our forum in October. This will be simply an overview of the legal standards throughout the time on gender equality, the dimension of, of gender. Um, it started, started of, of course, in the 50s. Uh, then it was focusing on equal pay between women and men. But over the years, over the past years, this, this, that this um, definition has changed. And we have to understand and to know this. When you're speaking with people who have a different voice, it's good to have that knowledge in your pocket. Secondly, a document that we will launch um, within a few months, it's exactly on what could be your own narrative to counteract those anti-gender movements, those anti-gender narratives. We don't have the wisdom per se at Eike, but we have spoken with many, many different actors in the past two years. And we have found strategies that really do work. So that will be our second paper. And that package hopefully will also help you all, will help policymakers, will help governments to counteract um, these anti-gender voices. That's very important. Thank you very much um, for talking about both the national uh, action plans um, and the uh, importance of uh, tangible results there, and what EGE is also doing to help uh, governments in this re respect from uh, more of the ideal, ideological uh, point. Thank you. Uh, dearest uh, Angelova, um, if you have more <laughs> tips uh, for national governments as well as the EU, we'd like to hear that. Thank you very much. Uh, so um, perhaps I'll take a little bit different perspective. I'll take the, per the perspective of the fact that uh, gender equality and inequalities for me are a matter and very closely re uh, linked to the beliefs, perceptions and the state of mind. If a woman allows to be treated in an equal way, this is also the matter of behavior and strength. Being a mother of two and having a good family and relatively good career, I can say that it's an everyday struggle for me to really stand for being equal in a home where I have three boys uh, together with my husband. And every time that they uh, really try to say that uh, cleaning the dishes and washing is a female job, I should stand and fight, and I do, and now they are very capable to do these female things. But the changes, they start from all of us, and in that change, we should now make any compromise, any. I think that the pandemic actually can boost this, because the pandemic also forced many women to be better organized and to organize better their families. To that extent, because we speak about the economic recovery, I'll take also the, uh, the perspective of uh, boosting the female entrepreneurship. Strange enough for me, I found some data when we are preparing the opinion that Europe has the lowest rate 
of female entrepreneurs. And some of the explanation being that, that uh, in Europe, the workplace uh, places are uh, perceived to be safer as in the rest of the world. So that's why women, they tend to take just the job and uh, then they are not incentivized to be entrepreneurs unlike the rest of the world. I think that Europe is losing a lot by not unleashing the potential of female entrepreneurs. And I think this is something to be done uh, where uh, we have to take uh, really our role. There are a lot of funds now available because it's an unprecedented flow of money uh, from the next generation EU together with uh, the multi-annual financial framework. And we have to be proactive to convince our governments to invest them wise. Saying this also, I would say that uh, next year is a window of opportunity because the European Commission declared next year as European Year of Skills. I think that this is what we have to join forces together with uh, trade unions as social partners to really encourage women to uh, obtain new skills. And to that end, we also have the uh, recommendation on individual learning accounts and on micro-credentials. So it's easy, uh, it's convenient for women to take short courses and to gradually reskill re or upskill and take new challenges. But it is about going out of your own zone of comfort and taking some new challenges. So all in all, I'm positive because uh, Europe lacks talents and uh, gender equality really gives a huge talent pool that we cannot import from third countries. And uh, the easiest shot is to just promote better gender equality. So I stand ready and very curious what uh, fruits uh, the future will bring to that table. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very inspiring. And uh, dear uh, Ms. Zarella, uh, could we also hear from you um, on your tips? Sure. Um, what I can do is to bring the private sector experience uh, and uh, I would like to build on what has been said because obviously it's uh, everything is so important uh, and somehow in, in our reality we try to do our part. And, uh, um, what I would like to offer is uh, our openness and contribution sharing uh, our way of working uh, when it comes, for example, of running these pay transparency policies, uh, um, which we strongly suggest to introduce where they are not and maintain where they are. And at the same time, to run inclusivity surveys in every workplace to hear directly from people, what they think, what they see, what they experience. And we are very open and willing to share our experience, but also our learnings, because not everything is successful everywhere. And, uh, and then I would like just briefly to mention two dimensions that for us are really, really important and where we would like to join forces, uh, um, which are addressed violence against women and girls. So we, we really want to do our part that we are trying to do. And, um, uh, a very still recent, so live topic, the, the refugees' employment. So we would like to keep running these programs to help refugees to gain new skills and new competencies and be able to, to have jobs in our countries, uh, no matter if it's in IKEA or in other, in other companies. Thank you uh, very much. You have already touched upon uh, what uh, companies, corporations uh, may do uh, to enhance uh, gender equality. Uh, I would like to ask more specifically uh, our other uh, panelists, uh, what is the role you think of non-state actors, uh, including social partners, private organizations and non-governmental organizations in ensuring a just and equal post-pandemic uh, recovery. And thank you for staying with us. And I think uh, you may think of other questions uh, coming up after this. So may I ask uh, you first? Okay. Thank you. I, I thought that the questions was directed first to the companies, but I'm glad to, 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 to step in. Uh, of course, uh, what we can do, uh, 
there are different models in Europe, but what we have learned, not just from the pandemic, but in, in, in many years, uh, that uh, where social dialogue is effective, uh, where collective bargaining is vital and thriving, uh, then uh, recovery, recovery is easier. So now we are facing a cost uh, uh, of living crisis. And what we need to do now is to uh, uh, find a way out of this. And to find a way out of this, we have proposals. But of course, these proposals must be heard and discussed not only from the companies, but also from the government, so we need more, more uh, uh, really a trialogue going on, a well-functioning trialogue going on. We need to have pay rises. We have been having these campaigns for 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 a lot of time now. We need to have pay rises so that the internal markets can keep up and can uh, uh, find uh, uh, a way to, to get out of the crisis too. You know, there is a, a direct link uh, uh, between uh, uh, internal market, small, medium, uh, micro. We've been talking about entrepreneurs, but entrepreneurs means that uh, um, increasing the number of entrepreneurs means to have more micro and uh, small companies. And micro and small companies often do not compete on the international market. They, comp they compete in the internal market. So if uh, uh, salaries are too low to foster the internal markets, uh, uh, we have to think about it. So pay rises are needed, but also uh, uh, see that uh, payments, there are payments targeted for people struggling to afford the energy bills. That's the news, that's the, the, the most uh, uh, worrying, uh, the, the biggest concern for, for, for many families, for many single or, uh, let's say, normal families, uh, biparental families, how we can call that, to put food on the table, to pay the rent. So the right to food and warm home are human rights. So we cannot, we cannot say that they aren't uh, and must be protected. And, and again, uh, uh, we, we, we need national European anti-crisis support measures to protect incomes and jobs in industry, services and the public sector, including sure type measures to protect jobs. So again, what we need is uh, a well-functioning uh, uh, bipartite or tripartite social dialogue, uh, collective bargaining extended to all sectors because we can see, for example, the Nordic model, we, we all know the Nordic model, they use a lot of collective bargaining and social dialogue and it works. So why not extending this model uh, to uh, other countries or to the European Union as a whole? And collective bargaining means that interests of workers are respected, voices are heard. It's not just big microeconomic policies uh, that are far from the needs of workers. Thank you. As expected uh, from you, the trade union's view on uh, Yes, uh, social dialogue is very, very strong. It st st stands a strong uh, signal to all of us. Um, what would you um, say is the role of uh, social actors? Thank you. Well, of course, um, it's very important because the Commission can set standards, governments can set standards, but in the end, it's it's uh, uh, it's a cooperation with many different stakeholders in society. That's of course relevant. Um, this morning, the notion of gender mainstreaming was mentioned, and I, I have seen. Well, I'm now putting on another hat because in my previous life, I was director for gender and LGBTI equality in the Netherlands in the Dutch government. Of course, we developed policies and, and we launched initiatives, but I also found out that very often for the other actors, it was quite difficult to understand. Uh, what, how they could contribute and what they could do. So what we did a lot at national level is that we worked closely together with them in, in pilot projects that, for example, we supported. Um, I want to mention one initiative that, that, we, that was born in the Netherlands and that was indeed in cooperation with, um, with employers. 
it was a chartered talent to the top yeah, that they could that they could uh, step into and then work on uh, the goal of having more women in top positions uh, and basically also changing their whole HR policy because of course the target as such is not the only thing that's important. Um, so I hope that in, in many, many countries this is what governments do and that they also see what are the relevant stakeholders. IG is, is monitoring uh, the institutional, institutional mechanisms on gender equality in the member states. So we look at the, the let's say, the national offices, the budgets. Um, we also look at the role of civil society and there I see a very worrying trend because of course what we have seen over the past years and this is, by the way, also linked to these anti-gender movements eh, who successfully um, sometimes convince their governments that they should no longer work together with civil society. And that's a trend that is really, really worrying. They lose their finances, they're no more taken seriously, and civil society is of utmost, utmost importance. And also for my own institute, I mean, we gather data and information um, on the situation of women and men in the EU. And of course, we rely heavily on data providers like Eurostat. But there's also so much knowledge with civil society, with NGOs, with equality bodies. And so what becomes more and more clear to me is that if we don't find the official scientific data, and there's other sources that are very relevant as well, trade unions, employers' organizations, um, so I can only say no, it's of utmost importance that, uh, that governments, uh, let's say, recognize the importance of the different stakeholders and if possible that they also close, closely work together with them, that they give them some stimulation. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that support and uh, Miss, Miss Angela, um your views on this uh, area. Thank you please. very much. I'll start from uh, where uh, Karlin stopped, that uh, the social partners and civil society organizations must be recognized and must be uh, really used as a source uh, driver for change by the governments and the European Commission. Uh, the social partners are very important. They have their democratic mandates uh, with the members and the civil society organizations are really the uh, the field where the uh, change is generated, where all the important ideas are generated. So it's our uh, joint responsibility not to forget this. Uh, what they can do together? For me, I'll take uh, the, mo the important uh, points made uh, by you as well, that uh, mentoring and uh, uh, um, counseling programs are the most important thing on the field to help women believe in their potential and go for uh, changing uh, the attitude towards them. Uh, I was working with an Austrian institute that they had a very interesting behavioristic studies and they say that most, uh, in most cases women are tend to be more introvert while men are tend to be more extrovert and uh, having equal uh, conditions then women are uh, taken as underperforming just because they don't know how to promote what they do and they are the silent achievers. I think that we have to really tackle this at the ground level and uh, take it by, on case by case basis, otherwise we cannot generate change. I don't believe in uh, this uh, cause for uh, ignoring the macroeconomic reality. Everyone struggles with the crisis. Also companies, including the micro and small companies, they struggle. Can you imagine these uh, uh, spikes of the energy prices if you have a contract and you have to deliver products and your energy spikes and all of a sudden you don't have profit but still you have to pay your employees and you have to buy more materials and you have to compete. So I think that we are all the same boat and asking for uh, higher payment should also go for asking for more 
productivity and uh, better competition uh, policy for the companies. Otherwise, we will be seeing a lot of closures of business and then rise of employment and then also uh, decrease of public incomes and uh, revenues. So therefore, I would be saying that we should work on the ground to change the situation. We have the legal uh, instruments in place. It's up to us to enforce, and this is the social partners and civil society organizations, and try to achieve positive impacts by giving best practices, positive examples, stimulus, and making the success stories public because they are a source of inspiration. Thank you. Yes, so <laughs> what I can add here is uh, uh, I strongly believe that uh, the more complex the issues are, the more we need to cooperate and there is a, not only one solution or one vision of that issue uh, to solve it. So, once again, uh, we can offer uh, 168,000 points of view only from our company and uh, many, many stories uh, of uh, coming from our people. We try to listen to them, but obviously we are open to share everything that we have learned so far. And uh, um, I really think that the, the Every contribution is important. There are many, many other companies that can do that, but obviously I'm here today. I have this privilege, so <laughs> I can talk from our perspective. But thank you very much, because I see a bright future despite all the challenges that we have, and we happily will contribute to this bright future together. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I have heard a wealth of uh, um, tips and uh, recommendations from you based on your experiences and, and the data. Uh, and uh, it has been very, very inspiring. Uh, and it's uh, up to the audience uh, now if you have any more questions, uh, either to the whole panel or addressed to one of our speakers particularly. Uh, can you please come uh, forward? <laughs> And I wonder if there has been any questions from the uh, online audience. Yes, sorry. Um, Elish Kerkova, Masaryk University. I'm happy to be here and thank you for the board. Uh, the biggest problem I see is the denial, ignorance uh, or blindsidedness of the majority of particularly, but not necessarily all the men, voters and politicians living in a stereotypical patriarchy en environment when it comes to gender-based discrimination and violence, which makes the policy stuck at place and the policy cannot be enforced through this, through this through our parliament in particular, or the Senate. What are the steps or strategy that are needed to take to make this part of society at least accept, or in the better case, to take action against the inequality women face every day? Thank you. Thank you. Shall we um, take um, Yes, uh, I would then ask the questions, uh, all of them, and uh, please reflect on them uh, later on. Uh, do you believe that the private sector should be doing more to drive gender equality? Should the Commission's legislative proposal for a directive on corporate sustainability due diligence take a gender responsive approach? Okay, uh, and we have another question as well. Should there be an EU-wide initiative to pressure international firms into implementing gender equality further within its employee structures? Both of these are more, more uh, concerned with corporations and, uh, and companies. So, um, can we take the floor from that uh, end <laughs> this time? Thank you very much. Um, yes, so um, if the private sector can do more, for sure, we can do more, we can do better. And uh, the, the thing is that we have our vision and we have our ways of uh, working on such um, important and relevant dimensions and we can do our part, but in some cases, and that's probably we are here, so diverse in this panel, we need more than the effort of uh, one only sector. 
So definitely what we can do in private sectors is to work better uh, to raise the level of awareness. And I don't know if I'm also partially answering the, the question from the audience so that obviously it's not only supporting and empowering women to believe in themselves, uh, to have mentorship, to have the, the opportunity, concrete opportunities to grow, is also how to involve men in uh, taking this topic seriously and maybe be the one mentoring and supporting them. And that's something that, for example, we try to do. It's not only a female topic that we have to help each other, we have to create our own community, let's say. We do it, we strongly believe it's important uh, that women support women, but it's definitely and probably more important if men understand their role in supporting women. And I think this is something that uh, in every sector we can do, we try to do in, uh, in, uh, in uh, our company. Thank you. Uh, while subscribing to what has uh, just been said, uh, I would uh, take it uh, from there. So uh, the private sector, uh, of course, uh, is acting uh, according to the rules and uh, to the requirements the external stakeholders are posing. Being uh, gender uh, equal, it's modern, it's trendy. I think that uh, uh, every company understands this and they really put a lot of efforts. But alone, they cannot succeed. And here comes the role for social partners to help the companies by giving them guidelines, programs, different tips for how to be more effective in this. Because as it was pointed, every company has its own policy. But it's, it's not up to the company to assess what's working better. Why not to take something that already is a good example? So for me, the answer is really the social partners and the civil society organizations should be more active and more vocal uh, sharing these areas. Then uh, the, the, the second Second element, uh, when, uh, for example, at national level, uh, the uh, tools are not uh, any more available, then it comes to the European level, because the European social partners, they have the role, according to the treaties, to be co-legislators. Once they conclude amongst themselves uh, an agreement, then the European Commission should uh, uh, enshrine this agreement into a uh, European legislative uh, uh, framework. So it has been done, on, for example, uh, on the framework of the telework uh, once upon a time 20 years ago but uh, uh, if uh, the European social partners are called against again for this we can take uh, together uh, some some uh, more actions and finally for the international companies I think that international companies uh, and uh, big companies they uh, uh, are also a vehicle to transmit such kind of uh, uh, cultural elements and to initiate cultural changes just for the fact that they deal with uh, many cultural aspects and they have uh, resources and knowledge how to deal this and then can be frontline uh, in uh, such kind of change. Of course, it can be reflected in a positive way, as I already said, in the different uh, uh, codes, including the, uh, the sustainability uh, due diligence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you for Minister uh, Sierangela for coming back. Uh, sorry, sorry, because I have an, an urgent teleconference and I couldn't avoid it. Um, first of all, it was not only private sector or public sector, we have to be all together private sector, public sector, and of course NGOs. And uh, as uh, you already said, it is not a woman issues. There are human rights issues, so we need men and women all together to fight for our rights. And uh, at the same time, for example, the, the big companies have not a problem. The problem is uh, in the small and middle class companies, and there the, the states must give more to them. For example, in uh, care units in the uh, small and middle uh, companies, because all the big, uh, in the small and, and, uh, and medium companies, because all the big companies have the money uh, to do all these things. For example, when we ratified the European directive uh, for the parental leaves, uh, when I said to a big company that uh, we have now we will have as a state uh, also for fathers leaves after um, the board, uh, after the birth of their child, they said, "Okay, we have already now." So the small and, and uh, the medium companies have uh, the problem, and uh, we can uh, keep on this. Thank you very much.
What would you say? Well, there's many different questions on the screen. Uh, there's one more. Uh, yeah, about the Commission's legis legislative proposal. I would say that any proposal of the Commission uh, should be gender sensitive, um, including this one. And I also take it that with this gender equality uh, strategy that they have and all the initiatives, that this is what they are checking when they're designing legislation. Um, maybe to take a more umbrella view, I, I strongly believe that whoever the actor is, they will only implement or take a gender sensitive approach if they see, if they see what it brings to them, if they see the added value. And I have been working in, in gender equality since 2002, and I have, op I have observed very often, and I think the same goes for all of us here, that if you use the word gender mainstreaming, people completely block. They have no clue what it is. And as soon as you explain what it is, and, and that it shows the, the, let's say, the white spots in your policies, for example, and how including the gender dimension simply improves those policies. Because, listen, all governments, when they're designing policies, I'm convinced that they want to design the best policies ever for their citizens. And what they should really understand it on the basis of a good gender analysis, and they should design these policies so that, so that they take the realities of women and men into account. Um, a little sidestep, I worked in the Council of Europe before I joined EIGE as, as EIGE's director. And then I worked closely together with colleagues in the Council of Europe who were work, working on combating terrorism. And in first instance, when I spoke with them about the, the relevance of the gender dimension, they had no clue what I was talking about. And they said, no, no, in terrorism. And then I explained what we saw in, in Netherlands, how girls suddenly left uh, the country and joined ISIS. The same as boys, by the way, but the big difference was that for the boys, people said afterwards, and also the peers, yeah, you know, it was sort of obvious that he was changing. He, he started wearing different clothes, his mother was no longer allowed to watch television. For the girls, all the peers, the parents and the school said, we had no sign before they left. We had no sign. So those co these colleagues in Council of Europe, they did a really interesting desk research on the gender dimension in terrorism. And it was the basis for them to speak with the 47 member states that are part of the, that are a member of the Council of Europe. And they took it up really seriously because they saw that when you want, if you want to combat terrorism, you simply have to understand that there is a huge gender dimension in that portfolio. So whatever the actor, if it's the private sector, if it's governments, if it's others, people will only act if they see the, the added value. And, and the first question that was raised, I, I don't know if I fully understand the question, but you know, if there's clear resistance um, from certain groups in society, um, it's often because they don't understand and they don't see the added value. I, of course, I have met people who were totally against gender equality. But when I ask them, but do you have children? Do you have daughters and sons? And, and well, many of them, of course, had children. And I said, but is it then acceptable for you that in the European Union, your daughter has a higher risk to, to become a victim of domestic violence than your son? Or is it acceptable for you that after that great study that both do, that your daughter will pay, will, will earn much less, probably, than your son? People have to realize it's not a myth that is hanging in the air. No, gender equality is about all of us, each and every one. It affects our daily lives, and we should really be aware of this. And then uh, the last word, uh, the word gender is red tag. Yes, um, I know this, and this is the case in, in other member states as well. I would again like to mention that publication at EIGE, <laughs> will soon launch about the uh, EU standards on gender equality, but also that second document, how to communicate if you're confronted with such, let's say, convictions and, and, and notions. Um, I think an example is the Istanbul Convention. I worked in the Council of Europe when it was adopted, and, and I have seen the developments in member states. One thing I've observed is that people who have a strict opinion sometimes about what this convention does, most often they haven't read it, the text. 
They don't know what is in it. There's a lot of repetition of myths going, going around, and I don't want to say that it, it's the case everywhere, but it's important if you speak up publicly about something that is really important to you, you should at least know what you're talking about. You should have read the text, you should know what it is about. And for the Istanbul Convention, it doesn't work if we kept, keep explaining what it is not about. It's important to simply say to people, listen, the Istanbul Convention saves lives. Saves lives of women, saves lives of girls, and also saves lives, by the way, of men and boys, because they're also covered by, the, by that convention. So let's, let's do that. Let's show to people the added value. Let's show to people what, what texts and, and initiatives are about and, and what is in it for them. I could go on for ages, but let me not do that. Yeah. Thank Good you very questions. much. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's very valuable. Um, may I ask you for a short intervention? Keep it very short. Uh, I, I, I won't talk as a, a woman would do, a mother would do about this. I just keep. I, I agree uh, about the fact that every every directive, every legislative proposal should have a gender responsive approach. So, not just the directive on corporate sustainability due diligence. And I, I, I just say that um, we have two big challenges. The first one is the present one to support women working. Women workers should be supported because in the end for future generations, the model of a, a woman who is working, who has uh, children, who does not have children because we, 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 we have to accept that not all women want to have children. So this is a, a thing that a society should accept. Um, a, a, a woman who is successful, who can get, uh, let's say, the career she wants to, or who, are, who is uh, recognized, uh, her talents are recognized, this is a, a, a something that can do more for gendered mainstreaming than all the policies in the world. So these are models that get to the hearts of people and also of uh, uh, men, men who have to leave their comfort zone and accept the fact that the women can do uh, the same things that they do successfully at work, that they are a big part, an important part of society, and that their lives shouldn't be confined to family and home uh, and uh, domestic chores on the world. So, um, so I, I, it is true that men should be involved and committed to this cause. Uh, but again, uh, uh, they need to leave their comfort zone, as I said before, and, and uh, uh, accept uh, data, because we are using data, we are not using uh, uh, heard of uh, news or information, uh, and that they have to understand that in the future, in the future, this will lead to a general improvement of uh, our lives, of all, all of us. So, uh, first, in pres uh, presently, currently, we need to support women workers if we want to get in the future what we are striving for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as we have come to uh, the end of our allotted uh, time frame, I would like to ask uh, or thank all of our uh, honourable um, panellists for their contribution, for the evidence-based uh, uh, data, but not only that, a wealth of uh, suggestions uh, that we have received from you. And uh, what I have um, um, been able to see in that was the elevation uh, of uh, the issue of gen uh, gender equality, uh, that we should use uh, the pandemic as an opportunity uh, for strengthening that. Uh, and maybe the element of care uh, should be uh, uh, more uh, respected, more uh, attention should be uh, paid to it uh, when we are doing that. So thank you very, very much for all your contributions. Thank, thank you.
Můžeme? Exchange some interesting views and interact in a meaningful way. We are back now for the last part of our program today, the panel discussion about labor and care and challenges in disrupted economies. Uh, just to briefly uh, talk about the topic, uh, one of the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic was closely connected to the topic of childcare. During the school closures, parents, mainly mothers, uh, had to stay at home with their children. At the same time, they often had to combine taking care of the family members with online meetings, teleworkings and home office. Women have been uh, then saddled with the extra burden of having to adapt their working patterns with also having to play the role of additional caregivers. Single earner families and families with multiple children were affected the most. In this panel, we will discuss various challenges connected to care in the context of changes of the labor market. This panel will be moderated by Ms. Lenka Simerska from the Czech Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs. Therefore, I am pleased to please uh, Lenka to come. Okay, hello, welcome. And she will be joined by uh, the member of the Senate, Adela Šípová who came, uh, let's say, very unexpectedly, because originally there were supposed to be journalists Nora Friedrichová, who uh, were too busy to came, let's say, and Adela Šipová just jumped in. So thank you very much for this substitute. Katia Lenzing, Deputy Head of Gender Equality Unit, DG Just from European Commission, will also join the panel. Welcome. She will be online or in present. Katia Lenzing, online. online. Okay, so she will she will join us afterwards. Okay, uh, and Danielle Ziebenaller, Ministry of Equality between Women and Men from Luxembourg, welcome. And Catherine Riedler, Policy Officer from DG EMPL from European Commission. So, Lenka, the floor is yours. Lenka, you may start. Thank you very much for the introduction, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, dear Europeans, welcome to this panel. I hope we are all fresh to listen to uh, this challenging issue of labor and care uh, in disrupted economies. And uh, because we have this sudden change in our panel, uh, I would like to ask uh, our uh, guest from abroad, not the home one, but the, the one from abroad to start us up about the issue. So please, the floor is yours. Waiting for the presentation. <laughs> okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for staying, uh, even if the day is already quite long and after lunch is always difficult. But uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to talk uh, about uh, our work that we are doing in Luxembourg on gender equality. And uh, I will focus uh, my talk a little bit on the aspect of uh, data col collection as a tool to improve gender equality. So first of all, I will give uh, first a small outline of my presentation and uh, I will briefly talk about the Gender Equality Index, uh, which you know of course all, but I will give some uh, insight on the results that we have uh, obtained in Luxembourg. Then I will talk about our observatory for gender equality that uh, I am in charge of uh, since uh, very recently only. And then I will present uh, two studies, uh, one on the impact of crisis on gender equality but focus on uh, COVID-19 results. And another one which is uh, starting now, uh, which is to, uh, studying the impact of crisis on inflation and consumption, but also from a gender perspective. And to finish, I will give you some conclusions and some uh, thoughts that we are having uh, about our work and about uh, these studies. 
Uh, now you all know the Gender Equality Index uh, by the European Institute of uh, Gender Equality. It is a tool to measure the progress uh, of gender equality in the European Union developed by this institute. So each year uh, the EU member states uh, are scored for an index. This index uh, scales from 1 to 100, where 100 uh, stands for total equality. Uh, as you can see, there are six uh, core domains that are evaluated, so work, money, knowledge, time, power and health, and some uh, two additional domains. There are uh, 31 indicators that are used to uh, determine the uh, gender equality index, and uh, currently it is uh, evaluated for 27 EU countries. Now, when we go to Luxembourg, we can see that the Gender Equality Index uh, raises up to 72.4, which uh, ranks it ninth in the European Union uh, for this index. I'm not going into all the results for, for this index for Luxembourg, but I would like to point out only two observations. Uh, we have a best performance for us in the domain of uh, money, where our score is really good and where the ranking in the, in the EU member states is also quite good. So this means, for example, that we have um, quite a good equality for um, revenues uh, between uh, women and men. But I would like to point out that we have also big room for improvement when we go to the domain of power. Uh, we can see that uh, the uh, indicator indicates 53.4 points for the uh, indicator of power. And there we have to say that in the domain of decision making there is really a lot of work to do uh, in Luxembourg. We have quite good results in the public sector, but uh, less good results in the private sector for decision making uh, equality between uh, women and men. Now, having this uh, gender equality index uh, in mind, uh, we have uh, created in Luxembourg an observatory on gender equality, which is uh, inspired from the gender equality index from AEG, and uh, which covers uh, mainly the same uh, seven domains. We have uh, a lot of indicators at the moment. We have more than 280 indicators uh, that we use uh, to uh, describe um, the equality between uh, women and men. Uh, the indicators uh, are selected so that they are comparable uh, at the European level, which is very important. Uh, each time you collect data and each time you want to co uh, compare data between countries, they have to be comparable. This is a very important uh, issue. Uh, our main uh, mission was to cre create a centralized data collection on gender equality because we, of course, have a lot of uh, statistic uh, institutions in Luxembourg that collect a lot of data for the economic development of Luxembourg, for example, but no uh, um, collection was really focused on the difference uh, of uh, gender, so this is why we wanted to create this uh, centralized uh, data collection. And we also carry out some studies on gender equality and we hope that the observatory is, uh, will be used for political choices because we don't want to uh, have an observatory that is unused by politicians. So this was uh, our main uh, goal. Uh, we, had a, we have a lot of data sources. At the moment we have uh, 25 data sources which uh, go from Eurostat to national uh, data collections. We have also, for example, in the domain of violence, we have a lot of uh, NGOs and partners that uh, contribute with uh, questionnaires uh, to the uh, data for the Observatory on Gender Equality. And just a brief uh, outlook, how, what did this look like? So I'm sorry, it's in, it's in French. It will be translated uh, into English uh, by very soon, hopefully. But you can see that we have seven domains that are really similar to the ones that use, are used by AIGE. And um, I would like to stress, uh, if ever you go on, on our website to have a look, that I, at the moment we have only four domains that are published and we are currently working on the domain of education 
and on the domain of revenue, which will be published by the end of the year. And then next year we will focus on the domain of health, so the last one, Santé. Uh, and then we will have a complete overview of uh, data on gender equality in Luxembourg. So these are the, main, uh, the seven main domains, and if we scroll into the domains, we have, of course, a lot of subdomains, as I said. At the moment, we have already 280 indicators that are used uh, on these four domains that are currently published. So this was uh, the main tools on data collection that we have uh, in Luxembourg. And we have uh, also done some uh, studies on gender uh, dimensions. So these uh, studies also use a lot of data and service to, to evaluate the impact of uh, different crises. Uh, this one, I will show only a few results on our study uh, one, that was the gender dimensions of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have already talked a lot today about the impact of this pandemic uh, on men and women. And, um, what I present uh, this afternoon is only uh, some aspects on the labour market, so questions like did women lose their job more often than men in Luxembourg? And uh, for those who kept their job, what were the differences in time use across uh, gender? We have uh, analysed a lot more data like uh, the feeling of economic insecurity, also the impact on social lives. We have also studied um, the the compliance to sanitary measures uh, between women and men. So the study was uh, a bit more uh, than what I present today, but of course we don't have so much time to present the whole study. Uh, what we observed in Luxembourg was uh, there were changes in employment status uh, during the pandemic, and uh, women lost their job more often than men. Uh, mainly at the beginning of the pandemic. So if you look at this graph, you can see that um, the unemployment, the employment decreased for men, which you can see on the left, but it was not uh, statistically significant. And if you look on the second graph, which is uh, the pattern of the women employment, you can see that uh, in June 2020, there was a significant decrease in uh, employment for women in Luxembourg, and a slight uh, recovery afterwards in uh, spring 2021. Of course, this is not the whole picture of the situation, and Luxembourg government, like other governments, has reacted. And there have been measures that have been adopted, like temporary unemployment, and also the COVID-19 family leave, which was uh, allowed uh, for parents uh, if their children were uh, in if their children had to stay at home. But also for the family leave during pandemic, we observed uh, observations. So regardless of the sector, as you can see, or maybe it's too small, but uh, you can see in the text that uh, women in April 2020 used the COVID-19 parental leave uh, and sick leave more often than men. So this has also already been discussed today and uh, I uh, can confirm for Luxembourg that women were more likely than men to benefit uh, from this special leave for family reasons at the beginning of the pandemic. Now, if we look at the time use uh, between paid and unpaid uh, work, we can see that uh, both uh, women and men spend on average an extra uh, time per day in household course. But uh, this increase was more persistent uh, for women and uh, for men, their, um, their contribution to housework went back to pre-pandemic times uh, in, in spring 2021. And for women, it persisted to be uh, more high, uh, their, their contribution to housework uh, was more high uh, even after the end of uh, 2020. So moving on to childcare, uh, on the right uh, panel of the, pic of the slide, we can again see that uh, uh, women in Luxembourg spend more time per day in activities with their children than men do. 
And when we look at the trends in childcare over time, we can see that there is some evidence for larger demand of family private provided childcare due to school closures, and that this was unequally shared by men and women. And the increase uh, in the provision of childcare in 2020 June was double for employed women than it was for employed men with a slight non-significant decline for women in spring 2021. Now, briefly, I uh, present you our second study, which has on only started uh, this month or last month, and it is on gender dimensions on inflation and consumptions. So we will study the impact of inflation on consumption for men and women separately, because we know that uh, women have, are more present in the lower salary uh, domain and women are more prone to poverty because uh, uh, women are, uh, because for example, for monoparental uh, situations, it's uh, mainly women, so they are more prone uh, to po poverty. But what we also are trying to study is if women can be driving forces for different consumption attitudes. Because um, we believe that uh, women and men are consumers, workers, entrepreneurs. So we will uh, try to understand if um, women can contribute to, to better consumption attitudes by having other ideas, by consuming differently, by consuming more eco-friendly, by by just having different attitudes so we would like this this um we would like to study this uh, impact of uh, women as uh, driving forces for different uh, economies now to conclude we can see that uh, covid 19 has impacted women more than men and women have suffered the most uh, the economic and social consequences of the health crisis and its policy responses we expect a gender deferring impact from our current economic crisis and i think that we can clearly say that crises do have different impacts on women and on men and we can also say that crises risk to reinforce existing inequalities we believe that it is important to consolidate data on, uh, and evidence on gender equality or gender inequality because having data helps politicians to, to be convinced about uh, ideas and about trends uh, for the future. We believe that it is important to reinforce resilience for future crises and better anticipate possible impacts on gender and again for this we need uh, data. And we also believe that we have to exploit the complementarity between women and men, their knowledge, their needs, their attitudes, but also their potential to have a gender dimension in, uh, tran as a transversal component in all fields of society and politics. So it's what we talk uh, already about uh, this morning, about uh, gender mainstreaming, and we, we believe this is really a very important uh, issue for the future. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Mrs. Ibenaler. I think that uh, we enjoy listening to the pra practice of Luxembourg, which is uh, really a great example. And uh, I must point out that you are perhaps one of the very few European countries who have a separate ministry of equality. Yes, and uh, you are also my favorite country from the professional point of view in terms of the gender pay gap because it is close to zero. <laughs> you are the number one, the European champion, so thank you for that. And now I would like to give the floor uh, to the two ladies uh, uh, who are waiting for us uh, and we are waiting for you online. Yes, we see you now, thank you. And. Um, I would like to start with Catherine Liedler, who is a policy officer from the DG Employment of the European Commission. Please. Yeah, in fact, uh, we are sharing our presentation, so Katya is okay, actually so, starting our presentation. Right. But very happy to be with you. Thank you for having us um, also online. Enjoy, Ben. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, uh, I was searching for the unmute button and now back to the screen. So, uh, yeah, good afternoon um, uh, to everyone. Um, apologies uh, that we cannot be with you in person. Um, uh, we would have liked to, but the mission budget did not allow. Um, but we're happy uh, to to uh, present you the European Care Strategy, um, at least uh, be with you virtually uh, in this very important uh, discussion on on the um, uh, gender dimensions um, or the uh, well uh, the gender equality and the economy. Now, uh, let me start by uh, highlighting uh, the, um, the gender dimensions in care. Um, and there are, in fact, three important dimensions. Now, first, uh, looking at the care workforce, uh, it's predominantly female and over, uh, well, women make up 90% actually of the workforce in care, so both childcare and long-term care. And then turning to um, the uh, unpaid care, so um, care for children or dependent relatives, um, it's again uh, women that shoulder the, um, uh, uh, all these unpaid care responsibilities predominantly. Uh, looking at the figures, you have almost all women that are regular carers and there are 81% uh, that are daily carers compared to 68 uh, and 48% of men, respectively. So really, the, the unpaid care uh, work and household work is, is very unevenly shared between men and women. Uh, and as a consequence, um, uh, women has less, uh, have less uh, availability to engage in, in paid work. Uh, now, here there's one figure that care, unpaid care responsibilities keep 7.7 uh, .7 million women out of the labor market. But you also have, um, um, I mean, this unequal sharing of, of care work between men and women has also further consequences. Um, and some of them were highlighted by, uh, by the previous speaker. So they often um, take, take uh, long family, le uh, family leaves or time out of their careers. They come back, uh, they work only part time, and that all leads to, to uh, a broken career path or scars in their career path. Um, to lower wages, um, fewer career opportunities, and all this accumulates then to lower pensions. And just to give you an um, um, uh, an idea about the the um, uh, the gender um, employment uh, pay and pension gap, the um, employment gap stands at uh, on EU average um, at 11 percent. Uh, the pay gap uh, at 13 percent and the pension gap uh, is on EU average at almost 30 percent. So that's a lot. Um, it, it means that in terms of pension, women uh, receive a third less on average than men in the EU. And then there's a third dimension that women are more likely to need long term care because they, they tend to live longer, but less um, often in good health. and due to the, uh, notably this uh, gender pension gap, they are less able to afford it. And with the care package, we want to tackle uh, these inequalities. Um, and over to you, Katrin, to introduce it. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, indeed, uh, last um, month, the Commission came forward with the European Care Strategy. Now, what is the European Care Strategy actually? First of all, uh, yeah, it addresses actually care from a comprehensive perspective. So looking at uh, early childhood education and care, but also looking at long term care. So care for the elderly or care for yeah, people with disabilities. Um, and we have, uh, so to say, a care package that um, includes three main elements. So we have on the one hand this overarching communication on the European care strategy. It's a communication from, from the Commission and it outlines really the narrative on the challenges um, related to care in the EU, also the opportunities and it also puts forward some actions at EU level, how the uh, 
um, EU can support member states in their care policies. And it's accompanied uh, by two proposals for council recommendations, uh, one on the revision of the Barcelona targets on early childhood education and care, and the other one um, on access to affordable, high quality um, long-term care. And um, yeah, so the uh, care package, the care strategy really aims to address um, the care recipients, of course, the people in need of care, children, all the people, but also their carers. So the care workforce, but also family carers, um, yeah, people who provide uh, care to, to a loved one, to a friend, a family member. Um, and yeah, more, many carers are, of course, women, so very relevant uh, for the topic today. Uh, overall, the care uh, the care strategy calls for improving access in particular to care services, uh, services that are of high quality, that are affordable and also available uh, close to the person in need of care. And it also for, calls for improving working conditions of uh, care workers and uh, work-life balance for informal carers in particular. And so the two uh, proposals for council recommendations will go into a bit more detail in a minute, but overall they are really there to provide uh, policy guidance for member states once they are adopted, because they, they are still proposals for the moment from the Commission, so the council still has to, has to uh, agree to them. Um, so once adopted, they should really provide kind of guidelines on how member states can uh, design reforms in the area of care, design investments, uh, yeah, to, to have uh, well-functioning care systems. Um, they, they both cover the adequacy, the availability and the quality uh, of care services and also the working conditions of carers. Um, then over to you again, Katja. <laughs> So, um, yeah, let's look first at the um, council proposal for a council recommendation on the revision of the Barcelona targets. Now, here we talk about um, uh, targets on early childhood education and care, so about child care. Um, these targets were originally set by the council in 2002, so 20 years ago. Um, uh, the target was set at 33% of children um, should participate in um, early childhood education and care. So here we are talking about the age range from zero to um, uh, compulsory to school going age. So uh, depending on the member state, it's it's six, uh, five or six. Um, it, these have been reached now on EU average, but there are stark discrepancies between or differences between member states. Um, and that's why we thought this is now time to revise the targets. Uh, why do we look at childcare? Because um, uh, we, um, we have seen or research has shown that uh, availability of uh, childcare, of high quality and, and um, accessible and affordable childcare is a key factor in facilitating women's labor market participation. So what we want to do here is to give um, uh, families, parents, um, a rich choice um, as to um, Uh, how they want to arrange their care arrangements by um, making um, early childhood education and care uh, available uh, and uh, thereby encouraging mothers to return to work after a period of family leave. So the key element of the uh, revision of the targets of, of this uh, proposal is the revision of the targets themselves. We distinguish between two age groups. Uh, the younger one is from zero to three. Uh, where we have proposed to um, uh, increase the target to 50%, so um, moving from um, a participation of every third child to a participation of every second child. Um, uh, uh, well, I can already tell you that this has met um, with concerns in the Council, so uh, probably this is not the, uh, the end of the, of the story, but uh, this is our um, the ambition we put forward. And then there's the second age group from three to the mandatory school going age, where um, uh, we propose to align the original Barcelona targets with a target that has already been agreed two years ago. 
um, in the education areas that actually 96% of uh, children in that age group participate in um, in um, childcare. Uh, now, there are two important additional dimensions uh, in the revision of the targets that member states should bear in mind. One is uh, concerns the time intensity, so um, it uh, should be um, uh, children should participate for a duration that um, is compatible with meaningful. Um, um, uh, working hours of uh, labor market participation of their parents. Um, and the second one uh, it concerns the um, particular group of children at risk of poverty or social exclusion, where we ask members which, which, which benefit more than other children from participation in, in um, childcare, but usually have lower participation rates. So here we ask member states to close the gap in participation between the children at risk of poverty or social exclusion and the overall child population. And then, as, as Katrin already mentioned, we have a number of recommendations to improve the quality, accessibility and affordability of early childhood education and care. We look also at um, uh, improving staff working conditions and at um, uh, measures to uh, reduce the gender care gap. So notably, um, we want to uh, tackle gender stereotypes or ask member states to, to um, uh, take action to um, uh, tackle gen harmful gender stereotypes and encourage men to um, uh, to engage more in um, in uh, unpaid care work uh, and uh, also encourage businesses, companies to uh, um, offer um, uh, working times and and uh, leave arrangements that are better uh, allow a better compatibility between work and private life. And then uh, finally, we have provisions on governance data collection monitoring and reporting all, um, as we have heard in the first presentation, uh, notably data collection is very important to make good policy decisions. Back to you, Katrin. Yeah, thanks. So on the proposal for council recommendation on long-term care, that is actually really the first uh, instrument at EU level on a long-term care. It did not exist like that uh, before. Uh, so here we have in particular three building blocks. Uh, so the first one is on yeah, adequacy, um, availability and quality of long-term care. Uh, here we mean in particular adequacy of social protection. So uh, to ensure that uh, care uh, is affordable, that uh, someone with a long-term care need does not fall into poverty because of these uh, care needs. Uh, that the yeah, care services are available, also reducing the territorial inequalities to ensure that uh, there is um, Yeah, care available for everyone, also in rural and depopulated areas. And that people also have a choice in what kind of long-term care they would like, whether they would like to have uh, home care uh, in their own homes or living in a residential care, community-based care. And a big focus also on quality, um, so there are uh, so that there are really quality standards, quality principles that are uh, in place, and also quality assurance mechanisms to make sure that yeah, the quality principles are also um, yeah, enforced. Then the second billing block is focusing on carers, as I said already, so really ensuring that we have enough uh, care workers uh, who, who are, because the demand for care workers in the long-term care sector will increase. There are already shortages in um, a couple of member states and this will only increase in the future due to the demographic developments. So making sure that the working conditions are good, that wages improve, here we want to work in particular with social partners, um, trade unions and employers to make sure that the wages are adequate um, and uh, also support measures for informal carers. So on, that, on the one hand, providing informal care is a choice. Uh, many people want to do it, but also if they want to do it, that they are 
better supported in their care responsibilities, that they have, for instance, adequate, that they have training uh, to be able to provide good quality care, um, that they have uh, also financial support, um, be able to maybe take uh, off uh, time from their care responsibilities to have yeah, respite care available for them to take a break from time to time. And then similar to uh, the, the council recommendation on the Barcelona targets, we also have this chapter on governance, monitoring, reporting, uh, yeah, where it's about uh, ensuring that at national level, all of the actors uh, involved in long-term care are working well together, that there is a, a plan on how to monitor the implementation of the council recommendation. Member states are also, according to the proposal, encouraged to uh, set up a, an action plan um, and that there is also a national uh, da yeah, data collection uh, framework and also how the Commission will report on the and monitor the implementation of the Council recommendation. And then the proposal is um, accompanied by an annex where the Commission has set out a number of quality principles that should be ensured at national level. And uh, finally, there is also a staff working document that is a document that is quite um, analytical, outlining, again, the challenges. Um, there's a lot of data included, so kind of the analytical underpinning for the proposal, um, and also a lot of good practices that are already happening at member state level that could be, for instance, um, yeah, introduced in other member states. So I think we stop here for now, um, but are happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you both of you for giving us a glimpse about the uh, European care strategy. And I'm sure we will, uh, we will talk much more about this in our discussion. And now let me move to our last guest, our home-based uh, unplanned guest, actually, <laughs> who is uh, Adela Shipova, uh, a member of Senate, Senate of the Czech Republic. Uh, I must say that, uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge uh, your presence in this conference, uh, the fact that by the afternoon you are still here listening to all the data and analytics uh, that we are all presenting here because uh, what was uh, said already here a few times is that we all want politicians to listen uh, to the databases. So uh, thanks for that. and. Um, we uh, we wanted our plan initially uh, with the other guest was to speak about uh, one vulnerable group who got uh, attention during the pandemics, which was the single parents who are most likely statistically single mothers. So my first question to you would be uh, your experience as a senator, as a politician, and maybe also as a lawyer with this group. and. Uh, to everybody, uh, we forgot one thing uh, at the beginning. Uh, me and Adela Shipova would like to chat in or have this conversation in Czech. So whoever does not understand uh, Czech language, uh, this is the time to grab your headphones. I'm sorry about not mentioning this at the beginning. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, just a question. Is this also available for us online? Probably not. The translation. Uh, translation online. Do our colleagues online have a translation from Czech to English? Uh, that's something I don't know. Máme český překlad, respektive z češtiny do angličtiny jdoucí do online, prosím, nebo nemáme? Budeme, výborně. Yes, so my information here from the technicians is that you will get a translation online as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
you. <laughs> so I just always go to the beginning. So I think we are almost complete. And if the trans translation is running online as well, we can start. Okay stream will have online translation but not the zoom so those of you who are watching us via zoom will not be hearing english translation from czech it's a technical limitation <laughs> okay let's start Madam Senator, can you tell us about your view of the issue of single parents uh, and where do you see the gender aspect? Because in Czech we often hear uh, the uh, uh, neutral expression parents, but then you can hear the uh, generic masculinum. But uh, I know that you have experience. So sorry for speaking Czech because uh, my participation is unexpected. I was about to leave, actually, so I could not prepare for making this contribution. I am a senator and also I am a lawyer, an attorney lawyer. So I have a certain experience, uh, even though I do not have data, I have a certain, a certain experience with uh, the issue of uh, uh, single mother's uh, uh, poverty risk. Yes, of course, we often speak about solo parents, but my experience is that it's especially single mothers uh, who are uh, greatly affected uh, by uh, these problems. But uh, I must say that I was addressed also by a single father uh, who asked me for help. So, but mostly it's women it's single mothers who are affected by the poverty and by the uh, issue of upbring of children upbringing often i have seen that if uh, women are facing any problems in the family they often do not have money to uh, pay uh, a lawyer so mostly when uh, helping single mothers, I was helping them pro bono without payment. Uh, this is also what I am doing now as a senator. I don't want uh, to elaborate on that and to go in in great detail, but uh, uh, women are approaching me with many problems like uh, economic dependency because uh, women's income is lower than men's and often they uh, have to work part time when caring for children, so their income is lower and they have to combine all that with the care for children, which is really difficult, especially if you have uh, uh, preschool age children children, school-age children, sometimes these facilities are very uh, costly. The mothers have to pay for hobby groups for the children, for school meals, etc. So uh, uh, originally there should have been Mrs. Uh, Friedrichova here, the founder of the Closet Project, uh, which I kind of know. It is a problem of material assistance to mothers uh, who do not have enough money to pay uh, the clothing for the children or uh, school aids. Uh, I uh, have watched this project uh, with great passion. And uh, so I have, we have arranged for a similar project in Kladno, which, uh, Kladno district, which is the district which I am representing. So first of all, during the COVID pandemic, we collected 
updated uh, computer technology for kids uh, from these vulnerable families who did not have money to buy a computer for the kids to uh, uh, get connected to the online uh, lessons, to the online schooling. This was a hugely successful program, appreciated by the mothers, and we also distributed uh, food. So this is quite a painful experience uh, to me to have to look at the mothers who even have to ask uh, for food. Uh, this is really too much, and it's really alarming, uh, so to say. Uh, at the same time, I could see uh, that frequently uh, it is difficult for the mothers to find a kindergarten or a school for the kids, so the care availability is sometimes quite problematic. So maybe uh, this might be uh, addressed by way of spreading more information, because I can see that politicians are sometimes blind. Uh, as regards the, the difficulty of uh, uh, fixing all that, finding a school, finding a doctor, because it's mostly women who do all these things. So it is a big mental burden, uh, which uh, uh, leads to uh, enormous, huge exhaustion among women. And so uh, I have this experience because I try to help women as a lawyer, as an attorney, especially those women who do not have money to to pay a lawyer. So I have the opportunity, I have the possibilities to assist them, and I can see it is really a huge problem. Uh, uh, I view uh, single mothers and single parents in general as one of the most vulnerable groups as regards uh, material security. your last sentence, actually. You said uh, that single parents are one of the most vulnerable groups. And uh, I would like to ask our panelists uh, if you think, looking back at the two years, past two years, starting with the pandemics, going to the crisis, uh, do you think that uh, we actually, as European Union, uh, as single member states have a good strategy uh, tackling all the vulnerable groups and their specific, really specific needs? Or what should be, where should be we looking next in terms of uh, securing care and securing uh, those needs of those people who are actually uh, um, vulnerable and want to stay and need to stay at the labor market, but face uh, very objective, um, um, very objective barriers. So, what would you say about that? I don't know who wants to, to start, if our guests online or Danielle. Hello, is it working? Yep. Um, so we have seen that um, uh, in the COVID-19 there, there have been uh, a lot of weaknesses that we have observed. There have been a lot of measures uh, put in place by, by the governments. But uh, teleworking was very good for everyone to cope with the situation, but then we realized that there was a double burden with teleworking, as you already said uh, in, in the introduction. We have introduced some uh, COVID-19 family really, um, release, and uh, there again we, we notice that there are more women than men who benefit from this situation. And we have had uh, distance education also, which was uh, necessary when the schools were closed. And also there we unfortunately were observed that it was women uh, who uh, had the, the biggest burden. So um, another area that we have not talked about yet is uh, social isolation, because in our COVID-19 study we have uh, observed that uh, women were more uh, isolated socially than, than men during and also after COVID-19. So I think that um, 
the crisis was of course unexpected and uh, governments had to react fast but we have to learn from this crisis in order to be more resilient for future crises so we we have realized that there is a gender specific uh, aspect and that uh, women react differently to crisis they are affected differently uh, inequalities are uh, are bigger after crisis so for the future we have to better anticipate possible situation possible conclusions for the women so this is i think the, the biggest challenge for for the governments to learn about uh, past crises and to be more resilient for future crises and as i said to better anticipate uh, future crises with the data that we have gained with uh, past crises is there anything that you want to add from the online space actually you said uh, uh, two magic words uh, enough care workers will we have enough care workers in future and uh, thinking about the pandemics actually what uh, brings this what you said to my mind is uh, many women actually the care industry is occupied by women and many women stayed at home with the kids with the pandemics so uh, suddenly we were facing a situation which was unprecedented and how, where do we go uh, th from there into the future having enough care workers <laughs> yeah I Katya, do you want to start? Or? Yeah, if I, if I uh, can start highlighting uh, really um, the two big weaknesses uh, that, that the pandemic highlighted is, is that there was an, yeah, an underfunding of the, the care system and that also means um, bad working conditions for the care workers, uh, which made the job less attractive for um, young people to choose that career path and that is still the case which is part of what we want to tackle with the um, with the care strategy and the other aspect is there's still uh, very much unequal sharing of care responsibilities between men and women and these uh, the, the very deeply rooted um, gender stereotypes that are that i mean um, uh, the, the data uh, from Luxembourg, but uh, I mean, we've seen that in other member states of the EU, uh, the, the, the figures were very similar that, yeah, during COVID, men did a little more on the childcare side, um, but this very quickly receded again and, um, and the old patterns were re-established. This is also what we need to tackle in order to, um, to ensure that, that uh, gender equality, that we can really um, achieve a gender equal uh, economy and that women uh, are not the only ones uh, that, uh, that are responsible for childcare or for caring for, the, for older people. Um, that we have at the same time institutions, uh, but then also a better sharing um, at home. Katrin. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I speak a bit more from the long-term care uh, perspective. Uh, I think for long-term care, the pandemic um, has not necessarily shown new challenges. It has mostly exposed uh, challenges that already existed before, but suddenly they became much worse and also more visible. And I think um, for long-term care, the, I mean, the, the worst uh, challenge was, of course, the, uh, the severe effects that this virus had on older people and um, the, the high death rates among long-term care recipients. 90% uh, of all the COVID deaths are people who are age 60 plus. Many of them were long-term care recipients in care homes. Uh, many people died. So I think that was really the, the worst, <laughs> the worst impact of this of this virus. But um, definitely, you mentioned the workforce aspect, and I think that was that that is uh, another big challenge that the pandemic has shown. Uh, the situation of care workers has already been very difficult before uh, the crisis, but uh, during the pandemic, these care workers, 90% of which 
of women uh, were really at the forefront. They were uh, exposed to the virus themselves. They were exposed to health risks. They were often left completely alone, especially at the beginning of the crisis. Um, they did, no one told them how to uh, handle uh, this situation in many countries. There was no emergency plan on how to deal with such a crisis. Uh, at the beginning, they did not have any protection equipment. Uh, I have a <laughs> mother myself who is an info, um, she's in the hospital uh, to do intensive care, and she also had to bring her own mask and her own gloves at the beginning uh, to the hospital because there was nothing. So that's something that is really striking me now with hindsight. Um, uh, also, we know, for instance, stories where where people, uh, care workers, had to, to they decided actually themselves to stay in the care home with the care recipients to for weeks live with them and do not have interactions with the outside world. So to protect the care recipients, which is really amazing, I find to hear these stories. But overall, we can really see now um, that. During the pandemic, there was such a big pressure on care workers. The working conditions really became worse. There was a high level of stress for a long period of time. Um, there were a lot of burnout, sick leave among the uh, care workers, which then meant even more stress for the remaining care workers. And now we see a lot of people also leaving the care workforce um, in long-term care. So that's an issue because already before the crisis, we had labor shortages in many countries and, and this really amplified and really became worse as a result of the pandemic. So that's an urgent issue, I think, for all of the countries. Uh, also for informal carers, we saw that for people providing informal long-term care, not only childcare, there was also already an over-reliance on this kind of care in many countries. And because of the pandemic, many uh, services closed, many care services, and also here family members had to step in, had to do provide more care, more intensive care. So that also uh, affected in particular women who are also the majority carers in, in long-term care. Thank you. Mrs. Senator Shipova, would you like to add a comment? Uh, I'm not. I'm not very f satisfied from my point of view that our politicians maybe did not uh, uh, do, did not make enough uh, for uh, uh, like, um, doing something with what happened during COVID. Our care workers were exhausted. Some of them, as I meant, uh, realized, some of them uh, left their uh, jobs. And uh, but. The one, one, one good point I, I would mention is that we uh, uh, that the directors of hospitals and these uh, um, these uh, healthcare institutions uh, realized that it is really good to uh, base. Uh, child groups who are taking care of children because if you don't have these uh, care workers you don't uh, who are at home uh, with their children then you don't have your employees so this is one one good thing which was uh, at, at the end of the crisis uh, that we uh, accepted one uh, one uh, one um, uh, law which which helps to improve these, uh, to base these uh, child groups. But um, for me, I would much be, I'm a little bit in, impatient in this. I, th I think we, we should m work more as politicians. Okay, that's a challenge. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to open up the floor to our discussion uh, all together to give the voice uh, to you in the audience. I'm informed there is also a Slido uh, questioning, which I try to access. Oh, yeah. Okay, here it comes. So first, I look among you if you have uh, something to comment on or ask whatever language you want to use. And in the meantime, let's read the questions. So what are the best means how to motivate fathers to take up parental leave? Uh, one million question. Uh, in the Czech, Czech 
uh, only 2% of fathers are on parental leave with their children. That's correct. Yes, so maybe looking at Luxembourg, what, is, what would be the motivational advice? Okay, so uh, we have a very interesting observation in Luxembourg for parental leave. Uh, there has been a reform of the parental leave in 2016. And uh, so I briefly explained there are a few options. Either you can uh, take six months or four months uh, full-time parental leave or 12 months or eight months half-time parental leave. Or you can stay at home uh, one day per week during as many months. And um, interestingly, since 2019, we observed that there are more fathers than uh, more men than women who are on parental leave. If we look at the numbers, but of course the forms uh, that the fathers select is the one day per week uh, parental leave, and the mothers uh, mainly stay at home uh, six months uh, on a stretch. But nevertheless. Looking uh, roughly at numbers, there are more men than women who take the parental leave. So this is really a very uh, nice observation that we can make. So what are the means to motivate fathers? Maybe it's, it's the, the form of the parental leave that motivates the fathers to, to, to take responsibility. I don't know how it is in Czech Republic, but... Um, um, as I said, the, the pattern of one day per week was uh, the, the one that motivated fathers to stay at home a lot. Yeah, that's interesting to know because uh, it seems that uh, the, the fathers were able to take care about themselves in terms of preventing social isolation, which is often the case with the mothers. And that's also the hindering factor to the paid labor afterwards. So this combination uh, seems to be quite viable. So thank you for this, uh, for this example. Somebody else? Yes, please. If I can add from the EU perspective, um, uh, because we have, uh, there's actually a work-life balance directive which was adopted uh, by the Council um, in 2019 and which had to be transposed uh, by August this year. Well, not all member states uh, have done so, but we are after them. Um, and that research uh, carried out in that context showed that uh, really in those countries where the parental leave is well paid, um, the, that is one factor that encourages uptake by fathers, which is normal when you think about it, because in many families, the father is earning more than the mother, or is even the sole breadwinner. So if you, you uh, don't um, uh, offer adequately paid parental leave, it will not be, the, the family will not be able to sustain itself. Uh, and the second aspect which we uh, tried, uh, where in the work-life balance um, directive we tried to um, encourage fathers is to provide that two months uh, of parental leave. And this is, a, this is like a minimum uh, requirement, so member states are um, invited to go beyond. Uh, two months of, of paid parental leave should be non-transferable. So the uh, the solution would be that either the father takes that those two months of parental leave, or the mo the money is lost and um, uh, and the family does not receive these two months um, of of paid holidays, basically. Or um, uh, and um, we see. Um, that, that some member states have also um, like a, a bonus uh, system that they say, okay, if the, the parents share the leave, then they get an additional month. And that is also a tool which encourages sharing between the parents. So, but, but it seems that also looking at other countries um, than Luxembourg, like Sweden, um, uh, like the Scandinavian countries, uh, which have a high uptake uh, of men, it's really the payment that um, that uh, makes a big difference. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, because of the online offline transfer, uh, we missed a question from the audience. Yes, do you have a mic or is there a mic circulating? Because otherwise the online audience doesn't hear you.
Thank you. I just wanted to ask uh, about Luxembourg uh, parent leave. Uh, this uh, flexibility definitely helps, but is this parent leave paid in full? Because this was just um, uh, mentioned, uh, research shows that men's take up of parent leave, it's when it's on full pay. So it would be interesting to see what is happening in Luxembourg. Thank you. Um, so no, it's not uh, full pay, it's a uh, maximum uh, amount uh, that is determined and which is, um, I guess, which is below the mean average uh, that uh, people earn in Luxembourg. So there is a maximum amount that you can have. But I think that if you take uh, parental leave of 20% per week, this uh, financial impact is also not as important as if you take full-time parental leave. But it's still a considerable amount of money and uh, it's uh, better than it was before our reform uh, in 2016. Thank you. Uh, the, the second question in Slido that I've seen uh, was actually partially already answered by the Commission. You mentioned the directive, the Work-Life Balance Directive, and what you are going to do to those states who did not adopt it or who are late with it. <laughs> Yeah, so in the first round, we already sent out, uh, I think it was on the 22nd of uh, September, um, uh, letters to the member states um, uh, recalling their obligation. This, this, these are called letters of formal notice. So it goes to those member states that notified only um, a partial transposition or that did not notify anything at all. And the next step will be uh, um, that we have commissioned um, a, rep like a research a report um, uh, that will um, uh, that is looking at all the national legislation and will tell will give us an assessment of um, whether that legislation complies and on that basis uh, so by the end of the year or early next year we will make our own assessment and for those member states that um, that don't comply we will follow up with the uh, infringement proceedings um, uh, and we have in the European Care Strategy committed uh, that we will really prioritize um, the implementation of this directive. So uh, this uh, we will um, uh, be uh, do this work, uh, this assessment of the compatibility um, or compliance of member states. We will do it more speedily than than we do for many other directives. Okay, thank you very much. Um, is there? Another question in Slido, as I believe, yes. As women will not be fully involved in the labor market. Aha, okay, it's the second part of a question. We often talk of part-time job for women or single parents. Won't this cause further inequalities? And second part as women will not be fully involved in the labor market and will be still perceived as primary caretakers. Who wants to comment on this? As, as far as I can say, the sociology of research so far shows us that it is still the case that part-time work uh, is not equivalent to the full-time in terms of opportunities and all the rest. So maybe what the Luxembourg data show? Yes, so concerning part-time, uh, of course, there are much more women than men that uh, work part-time. And um, I cannot say uh, so much about this, but you talked about the gender gap, which is uh, close, uh, which is below 1% in Luxembourg. And we now uh, try to investigate on the pension gap, which, which will be not as good. And this is also partly due to part-time jobs. So um, this is a field that we will investigate in the future and I'm quite sure that the results will not be as good for pension gap than they are for um, uh, salary gap. So mm -hmm. uh, part-time work is, is, uh, is a good solution, of course, uh, if you want to combine uh, family and work, but uh, you have to be aware that in this moment this has consequences uh, for your future development and also for the pension. And this is something we have to tell also the women that choose for this option. Right. Turning into uh, DG employment, perhaps, for a comment. 
Yeah, it's it's not my uh, specialty, but um, maybe uh, maybe what I can say is indeed also in terms of pension contributions, there are interesting models out there. Uh, I think uh, what the previous speaker just said, this awareness raising, making uh, women aware what is actually the consequence of doing part-time work uh, is important because I think uh, I think uh, women are often uh, surprised at the end of their career how little pension they receive uh, because of their, yeah, because of their part-time work for a long period of time or because of their career breaks. Uh, interesting examples are, for instance, that uh, you could share the pension credits with your partner. Uh, so that exists uh, in certain countries where you can make an agreement with your partner. Okay, I take some career breaks, I, I work part-time, but we share our pension credits. And as a result, the impact is, for instance, less severe. Uh, because I think it should still be everyone's choice to work part-time or not, and it's it's also nice to spend a time with your family. But indeed, uh, being aware of what that means at the end of your life uh, is important. Sorry, yes, um, maybe just to add that um, the. Um, there have this year been um, two countries that got recommendations from the European Commission because they had a too high part-time rate for women. Uh, it was not the Czech Republic, it was the Netherlands and Austria who were asked to, um, to, to make sure that, um, or to, amongst others, improve uh, childcare facilities opening hours in order to uh, allow women to, to engage for longer hours in the labor market um, because as as katrin um, uh, mentioned you know the impact on the pension is is um is very problematic and uh, with the gender pension gap at, at 30 percent um, uh, on eu average and uh, even higher one in some countries um, this is a bad awakening for a lot of women when they reach uh, pension age Okay, thank you for all your comments about part-time labor. Maybe can I have the Slido again? Yes, so part one, question too long. Do you think national and EU level direct measures have the biggest potential for change? Not sure. Uh, to what exactly this question relates to. Maybe the part two will say us more. Or our bottom-up initiatives, for example, awareness raising campaigns on gender stereotypes more effective? Okay, so as I understand the question, is it more effective to go bottom-up or the vice versa? What do you think? In terms of the provisions and motivational uh, implementation of changes, I will be very short. I think the bottom bottom up uh, um, initiatives are very good, but are not so effective. It must. I I think we see it. It doesn't uh, work so much <laughs> than if uh, if it is a priority of the governance. So it must come from the. Up. Up, up. Yes, from up, up. from top to bottom. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe in in our uh, national case, uh, it's actually good to distinguish whether it is the governmental initiative or if it's the EU initiative, because it also makes a little bit of a difference. Uh, if it's EU, then we can always argue with some good examples and uh, countries who uh, achieved some good results and are further in the development of certain question, uh, which uh, actually the part-time labor is one of the cases because we are still those, among those countries who are calling for having, uh, we want to have much more opportunities to, to work uh, part-time and we don't have it, while other countries are going uh, the opposite direction because they already been there and they are now uh, looking at uh, options how to, how to work more, how to participate more. 
uh, as women in the labor market. So uh, somebody also want to comment, somebody else, our online guests or Luxembourg about bottom up or the other way around? Um, I think I agree with uh, the lady <laughs> next to me. Uh, I think both are of uh, necessary uh, political decisions and uh, also initiatives from the bottom, but maybe they are not uh, so effective. We also go to schools and make campaigns on uh, gender stereotypes which is also important, which is uh, an important part. But I'm not sure about uh, which, uh, how, how effective this is compared to, to political decisions. But maybe both are necessary, but I agree that um, um, national and EU level direct measures have a bigger potential. And uh, you ladies from the, from the Commission maybe have one specific, specific perspective. Well, as previous speakers, I think really both are needed, or if you if you distinguish between national and EU level measures, all three are needed. So the EU to set minimum standards um, to reach convergence between member states, um, and then national measures uh, definitely um, to, to uh, set obligations, uh, and then bottom-up um, uh, projects, um, uh, campaigns and other approaches, which the EU is also funding, by the way, uh, or supporting through funding, um, that, um, uh, that contribute. I think uh, we, we really need a mix of measures here, and notably when it comes to tackling gender stereotypes, which is a very difficult um, issue where you need the lots of... Um, uh, we, you need to attack from all angles, basically, to, to change that, because that is very, those are very deeply rooted. Thank you. Then another question in the Slido is quite interesting. It's uh, a topic which is being discussed more and more. We are not prepared for, for this uh, topic in our uh, discussion here. Uh, it's about unconditional income. I think it's greatly related to the care issues. What do you think about introducing an unconditional income? Wouldn't that be a solution for ensuring a balanced distribution of care between women and men? Maybe you can just, uh, if you're not ready, which, uh, which obviously you might not be for this, but maybe some, I don't know, initial thoughts from your personal perspective. Or maybe turning to the Commission, is that something that's being discussed at the level of the Commission at all? Maybe I can come in. Um, I don't think the Commission has an opinion on this. <laughs> So even within DG employment, I think we never really uh, discussed this uh, so far. Um, I think it's an interesting idea. Now I'm speaking personally, yeah? um, but I think it would be important to have maybe a bit more data on it, a bit more uh, understanding how it works in practice. So I think any kind of pilot project on this would be highly, uh, highly appreciated from the EU side as well to see whether also what impact it has. Does it mean that again it's only women uh, taking uh, <laughs> doing the care uh, yeah. work then, or 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 does it actually yeah encourage more men to be engaged? Uh, I, I think uh, also, um, but again, I agree with uh, Katrin on uh, it would be interesting to see some pilots uh, to get data, but uh, it does not seem to tackle the, the root causes of the um, unequal division of tasks uh, in the families uh, of, of unpaid care responsibilities. So even if uh, and it doesn't, the minimum income also doesn't necessarily mean that None of the pair, neither of the parents is working. So it could well be that um, uh, that uh, then the mother is is left at home uh, um, to care for the children, and the the man pursues uh, his career. So I'm I'm not sure if that's the silver bullet, unfortunately. Much more discussion needed, I guess. No comments. I would maybe say I'm not against it, but we we should know how much it should be. Uh, what what should this uh, money uh, cover? If it is everything uh, like uh, living, food, uh, everything, or what? So this I'm not I'm not against this uh, uh, idea, 
but uh, it must be discussed much, much more deeply. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. So looking back to the audience, but I think everybody put your questions already in the Slido. So uh, let's see, we have two. Is it possible to make legislative changes in order to promote a more equal distribution of care within families? That's a big question. What are, in your opinion, the most pressing issues in working conditions of care work professions. If you don't mind, I would actually prioritize the last question because we are talking about care here and uh, maybe we can take uh, an opinion from each of you for uh, closing the panel. So what are in your opinion the most pressing issues in working conditions of care work professions? Maybe going from the Commission, starting with you ladies online. Yeah, I can come in. Yeah. Maybe. Or Katya? No, go ahead, Katrin, please. Okay. Uh, I think on working conditions, uh, the key issue is lack of investment. Um, lack of uh, staff, also the very low staff ratio to patients, so a lot of uh, times care professionals just don't have the time necessary to provide quality care. They feel they would, many care workers, uh, as we know from research, actually um, chose the care profession because they want to care for, for people. They do it from the heart, but they feel they cannot do their job properly anymore. And that really, uh, that really reduces their enjoyment of their care work and reduces their working conditions. There is also really an issue of um, challenging uh, social behavior. So for instance, mm -hmm. sexual harassment is an issue, even violence, verbal violence of patients. Uh, of care recipients, but also family members, and sometimes even physical violence. Uh, there is an issue also on um, occupational health and safety. So caring for a person uh, means lifting of the uh, people, um, handling medicine, handling some kind of um, yeah dangerous. Uh, dangerous substances. And during the pandemic, it was the exposure to the to the virus. They were mostly uh, affected by that. So yeah, really uh, psychological health, um, that is also that is also an issue among among care workers. So as a result, really, uh, we experience high shortages in many, many countries. And that affects, I think, all of us, because if ever we need care, and there is not uh, already in, in some member states, there are beds available that are just not uh, occupied because there's not enough care workers. And uh, eventually that will be an issue for all of us. Uh, but maybe I can <laughs> say also something positive. Uh, uh, I think that really in many countries, um, there is positive developments happening and a lot of governments are really uh, trying to address the issue, trying to come up with plans. Um, I think that in, in Czech uh, Republic, uh, there was really an effort to increase wages, for instance. Uh, yeah, um, really positive experiences from, from many countries to improve working conditions, to ensure that there are more people attracted to the care workforce, including men. <laughs> So not so some positive developments, but I'm also impatient. So <laughs> more can can happen always. Thank you, Mrs. Lansing. Yeah, maybe just to add from the childcare perspective, where the staff shortages are not as um, as salient as in the long term care um, on the long term care side. But here, what our what our experts noted was really also. Um, um, well, in addition to the comparatively low wages, the lack of career prospects um, and, and professional status of this um, of these uh, jobs, uh, which means well um, uh, that, that people just cannot evolve, uh, uh, and um, and then a lack of um, of time or possibilities for 
for professional training, so for continued um, lifelong learning, as um, as we see in many other professions. So those two um, additional points were were um, problematic from the um, from the the childcare perspective uh, to make the uh, this this career more attractive, um, including for men. Thank you. Uh, when we talk about uh, care uh, in, in hospitals, as uh, Katrin already said, uh, there was a big uh, shortage uh, during the COVID-19 uh, crisis and in Luxembourg it was uh, very bad because we, are, um, we have a lot of uh, people who come from abroad, from Germany, France and uh, Belgium every day to, to come and work in our country and uh, there was a big, uh, it was a big issue that uh, the, the shortage of uh, personnel in the hospitals was uh, going to be critical for us because this personnel was also needed in the neighboring countries. So I think uh, there is actually a political um, priority to to address this problem and maybe it would also be interesting to to have more men uh, in in into this uh, job uh, as well and i would like to add a final uh, point uh, which uh, is based on a comment that i received recently from a girl uh, studying medicine so going to the doctor level to the doctor level yes um, she was actually uh, discouraged uh, for uh, imagining to be able to be doctor and to be mother. And uh, I think this is a really a tremendous uh, mistake uh, in education that, that they received at the university, ob obviously. And uh, I think it is uh, possible to, to, um, to have both. And so we have to encourage uh, women to, to go into medical professions, being, be it a nurse or be it a doctor, and uh, never discourage them to do so because it's difficult to be compatible with family and social life. Thanks. And last in the circle, Mrs. Shipova. I must say I have nothing to say to it because uh, uh, I'm not uh, from this profession, but I know that uh, the stress in the hospitals was big and uh, it caused also uh, that a lot of people left this profession. So that's, uh, that's a pity and um, that's all I can say to this. Right, so uh, I think we come to an end of this panel. Thank you so much for uh, being here. I think we tried to touch upon all the many issues that are uh, there within this huge topic of care and labor in the disrupted economies. And uh, we at least to know where to look uh, for uh, much more detailed data into Luxembourg, the Commission, and uh, good luck in the Senate for your great work and I hope to see you tomorrow again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks to all the speakers. Thanks, Lenka, for moderating the event. I will just briefly conclude this first day of the conference. Um, we are about to end it, so let me summarize some of the main conclusions we hopefully bring home from today's conference. Um, I have some notes from the organizers who were present at all the seminars and panels, so I'll just read them so that I will, I will not left out anything important for them. During all the panels and seminars, the speakers stressed the importance of gender mainstreaming, which means reflecting gender and intersectional inequalities in all policies. During the seminar one, speakers recognized specifics of energy and environment, such as different impacts of environmental crisis on women and men, and provided suggestions on how to tackle energy poverty in a gender-sensitive gender way. On seminar two, the panelists agreed that women and marginalized voices were left out of some national recovery plans and that many national recovery plans lacked intersectional perspective. A set of recommendations on how to improve the situation was also provided. During seminar three, the speakers pointed out that women and girls fleeing Ukraine are particularly vulnerable. They emphasized that their integration 
should not be gender blind and states should cooperate and provide sufficient support for NGOs in this regard. Also, I would like to invite you to the second day of the conference, which will be moderated by my colleague and my, my friend Andrzej Trehoni. It will be more focused and concentrated on young generations, so there will be several panels concerning the problems and issues that young generation solve. Um, thank you, thanks a lot for being here, for listening, for being here until the end of the first day of the conference for this important topic and see you hopefully soon. Enjoy the uh, rest of the conference tomorrow. Bye.